All right, I'd like to uh, convene this uh, regular meeting of the Board of Visitors. Um, I'd like to welcome all of the board and staff and visitors who are present in the room and also uh, uh, identify the uh, board members who will be participating uh, via Zoom. Uh, Victor Branch, Jim Hickson, Ann Lee Kerr, Lincoln Saunders, Tom Watkins, and Brian Wolfock. And I'd like to make in a special uh, note congratulating uh, Lincoln on the birth of his daughter. Uh, congratulations. Your life is about to change. <clears throat> um, we've had a number of meetings over the summer, and you know many of them have been, been by Zoom. We had a uh, in-person meeting. Um, I just remind all the board members um, that when you speak, if you would also identify yourself, since there are a number of people listening um, on uh, Zoom and also on YouTube, and uh, also ask the people uh, on the phone to do the same. Um, so we're going to start uh, with my remarks, and then we'll hear from the two presidents, and then we'll get into our um, regular business. So good morning again. It's really good for us to be together, even if we have to be socially distant. Zoom and email have been useful in getting things done, but being present with students, staff, and faculty is an important responsibility for us as a board. Since the COVID-19 pandemic started, the board has met virtually or in person at least once a month. We've been working uh, so diligently and so carefully with the administration because we are, we are facing financial challenges not seen in more than 150 years. Yesterday, we heard several examples from this community where people are looking beyond survival and into a future in which we flourish, in part because of the mission-driven innovation that has become part of our response to the pandemic. This is not surprising, given our remarkable history of meeting institution-threatening challenges with creativity, commitment to our mission and values, and generally by all working together. The planning that went into the university's reopening was focused on creating as safe an environment as possible for our students, staff, and faculty, and was based on science and best practices. While many institutions can probably make that claim, so far it seems to be working here. Why is that? First. Many staff across the university worked relentlessly and tirelessly over the summer on protocols, changes, physical changes to our buildings and classrooms, and clinical approaches to manage testing and treatment. I want to say on behalf of the board how grateful we are for what we know was exhausting work. I want to thank the faculty for their flexibility and their efforts to deliver classes through multiple modes that make learning accessible to all. I also want to thank this community, especially our students and the leadership of Student Assembly, for not just being part of the process, but being keys to its success. Our shared commitment to taking the necessary steps to safely live, work, and learn together on campus has enabled us to reopen successfully. By all pulling together and by staying committed to the course we have set for COVID safety, we have made a meaningful difference. After the murder of George Floyd, we recognized the need to re-examine and recommit to address diversity, equity, inclusion in new ways and with a faster pace. We are doing so. Whether it was fundraising to bring to fruition the memorial to the enslaved, or examining ways to expand the number of students and faculty of color, our community again responded with creativity and a commitment to our mission and values. This is ongoing, important work to which we reaffirm our commitment. Inclusion and equity continue to be priorities for this board. One area where we haven't been as, as successful are the changes that we announced uh, earlier in September to our athletic teams. Before I talk about that, I want to thank every person who has written or called the board, the president, and the athletic director. I've read every letter that was sent to me and tried to respond to as many letters and calls as possible. I know my colleagues on the board have done so as well. While some were form letters, many individuals shared their own William & Mary story and why their experience as a student athlete was so valuable to their lives. <clears throat> I want to especially thank 
the nearly 80 students, staff, and others who came out and spoke at our public comment session on Wednesday. We are really grateful for your time and your willingness to share your personal perspective. Early in my career, I had a mentor who often noted that what you see is a condition of where you sit. This feedback, especially from our students, is incredibly valuable in helping us to see different perspectives and sometimes different facts. We also appreciate you calling us out where you think we have not met the standards we cherish. That is your right as a member of the community, and it is our responsibility as a board to listen and process that information. What isn't appropriate are the ad hominem attacks on individuals or attributing anyone's motivations to anything other than what is in the best interest of William & Mary. You may disagree with decisions or the manner those decisions were communicated, but please don't assume that the motivation was anything other than appropriate and well-intentioned. <clears throat> Additionally, spreading rumors or outright deceits, including impersonating others, is inconsistent with our values and is maliciously intended to further divide us at a time where we need unity. We all need to funnel our passions towards finding solutions, to act with mutual respect even when we disagree, and to have a civil dialogue in which we not just listen, but hear what is being said. This board has committed that our actions would be as transparent and, in, and uh, inclusive as possible, and we accept, expect the same of the institution we oversee. As board members, we each own what was a poor rollout of very difficult news. Whatever the intent or process, it was not consistent with the way in which we strive to interact with one another. We would not consciously disrespect our student athletes or alumni community, especially on issues of such personal importance. The board and administration have and will continue to make difficult decisions during these very challenging times. We know that this is a community that wants to be engaged in finding solutions. When we collaboratively seek solutions, we can achieve great success together, as we have done repeatedly during our history. We'll hear shortly from President Rowe about possible paths forward. She has talked about rebuilding trust. That must be our collective priority. The board's job is not to micromanage, but it is to provide oversight and ensure that the values and things we hold dear are honored. We are going to hold the president and the entire administration accountable to address the concerns that have been raised in a way that is consistent with our values. We have confidence in this president and her team and have seen what they can accomplish together. Many of the students we have spoken, we have heard from, spoke about what our motto, one tribe, one family, means to them. I can't promise you that we won't make mistakes, and I don't want to suggest that we have all the answers, but please know that our commitment is always to this family. And with that long introduction, I'd like to ask President Rowe to give some remarks, and I'll follow up with President Sido. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Good morning, everybody. Um, my remarks are a little bit longer than usual because there's so much substantive to speak to. I'm going to talk immediately um, consistent with what the Rector just said about our athletics path forward. And I am also going to talk about where we are with respect to our COVID response and then the bigger picture that I think we need to be thinking about um, underlying that response. Um, three weeks ago, the university announced its gut-wrenching decision to eliminate seven varsity sports. William & Mary is not alone among colleges and universities in making these agonizing decisions, but William & Mary is a unique and special place. Every day since has been so painful for the student athletes and families and our alumni who have been impacted. And I want to begin by addressing you directly. First to say thank you for sharing such powerful stories. I want you to know that we hear you. The Board of Visitors and I have listened. The Board heard you at the listening session on Wednesday night, and like many others, I've listened closely to those comments. I've also heard you in countless emails and in conversations that I've had since September 3rd. My office and the Office of Athletics has returned scores of phone calls and hundreds of emails, taken meetings. I want to say here what I've I've said to everyone that I've met with personally, it's simple, but it really needs to be said, I am so sorry for the awful loss and sadness that this is causing. That's real. Uh, I've been using the word bereavement, and I think that that is valid. We hear you. 
we value you and we are so grateful for all that you individually and collectively contribute to making William & Mary the extraordinarily special place that it is. So much of what we heard Wednesday night reflected a sense of broken community, of being adrift so far from our value of belonging. And taking this step now with a year to go, our hope had been to give coaches and athletes and families more agency and control in their choices going forward. But I hear clearly that the effect is the opposite and I regret that so much. I said in my email to the campus earlier this week that the chief task we face is restoring trust. One of the few things that we have more of under pandemic is time. So the next month is gonna be focused very intentionally on how we can go forward in a way that's aligned with our core values. Here's the plan as I see it. First, we own our mistakes, we continue to. The past three weeks, we as an institution have not met the high bar that William & Mary expects of us all, particularly in such difficult circumstances. We acknowledge the ways that we've fallen short and we take steps to redress them. The integrity and values that William & Mary holds dear should govern every aspect of what we do and we will adhere to them. Second, we acknowledge that with grief and anger, we are also hearing deep commitment to William & Mary. Every single person I've spoken with directly ultimately is motivated by what they think is best for William & Mary, not only for themselves, that's really important to listen to. With their intense passion, we also need to hear and we need to assume for each other positive intent positive intent as a baseline. And that's hard, particularly when we're in conflict, but the assumption of positive intent is gonna be critical to rebuilding trust. For those I talk with, I do hear immense respect across disagreements that can be built. But we haven't clearly named, I think, an underlying disagreement, which is about the identity of intercollegiate athletics at William & Mary. So I wanna say a few words about that, that underlying disagreement. I'm gonna share them with humility because I'm just two plus years here, but sometimes the ear of somebody who's new can help sharpen um, a particular dynamic. There is a core conflict here at William & Mary that we need to own as a community because it's a conflict that's very specific to William & Mary. As I've listened to students and staff, talked to friends of Tribe Athletics, fans and donors, I hear deep contradictions in what we mean by excellence and competitiveness in a Division I setting. I ask that we be in dialogue about this directly in a way that meets the community's standards. This is a contradiction that precedes many of us, but today I wanna name it as clearly as I can and call on all of us to address it. In 2018, the university engaged in a robust strategic planning process in athletics. We're so grateful to the work of all the individuals who are part of that. That process named this challenge with ensuring that the department provide competitive experiences and resources that match the quality of William & Mary academics. It's become clear, however, that this report was the beginning of a dialogue that we need to finish on this critical issue. We need to dig much more deeply into the assumptions made in that plan about competitiveness and what it means in a Division I context for the community now. To, we need to do that to ensure a shared understanding of what we mean by competitive excellence and intercollegiate athletics. Um, we need to be open about the disagreements that we have about that and finish this conversation by listening to all of the voices in our community, students and alumni, faculty and staff, recognizing that our starting place is Division I. Third, I'm gonna ask for your partnership very specifically in this work. Beyond the disagreement about what competitive success means, we face acute and intractable structural problems in funding athletics sustainably. I think this is widely understood. No one has really questioned that fact, especially right now when the university is facing such significant shortfalls. This is a long-standing issue and its solution is only gonna benefit from more open dialogue and problem solving. So many have asked, please can I help think through these challenges with you? And the answer is yes for those who are prepared to take these challenges on in a substantive way. Here's, here's what I mean by that. 
the path forward is going to require sustained dialogue, engaged with humility and respect for each other. At William & Mary, we know we gain. We gain value from thoughtful, deliberative decision-making and broad solution building. So starting early next week, I've asked Director Hughie and the Department of Athletics to do four specific things to enable this. The first is to share additional information that answers the questions we've received about what financial sustainability means. The second is to engage the Tribe Club Board. I, I haven't told the board this, but I, I hope they're willing. First, to validate and, if necessary, refine our assumptions in a way that grows confidence. That the community has confidence in our numbers and assumptions is absolutely essential. Third, is to work with the Tribe Club Board to, seize, to size the financial path for each sport to competitive and sustainable funding. So that here again, we have a shared understanding of the challenge that we're trying to solve and can bring others into that understanding to consider solutions. Key message, we are open to solutions that meaningfully and viably address those challenges. Fourth is to invite the athletics community, students, parents, coaches, and more into the discussion of the problem itself, how we understand Division I competitiveness, not only to create a shared understanding, but also to engage so many bright minds and committed spirits of our community in a forthright way. So the core premise that I work with in cases of conflict is that we need to respect the conflict. That means respect each other, name the differences. By respecting the conflict, we can find significant growth in our thinking. Conflict is, of this kind is, is motivated by deep interests and affiliations, and by understanding them, I know we can grow in our thinking. Uh, again, I'm just going to repeat my direction to myself and to our team. Our first and most important task is to rebuild the trust of this community and to repair the distress we've caused our student athletes, families, and alumni. That is not to suggest that the road ahead of us will be easy or that the status quo can remain. But I do think that if we roll up our sleeves together with a recognition that our love for William & Mary drives this collective action, and that our goal is to meaningfully improve an already special student athlete experience, I do have confidence we will succeed. So that's the first part of long remarks. And I will try to go quickly through the COVID part. Um, last spring, we sent out, set out four goals for our response to the pandemic, to safeguard the health of our community, to keep teaching and keep learning, to maintain our research and university operations, and to slow the spread of COVID-19. We've had success so far. We're now, I think, seven weeks into the first students to come back to campus. And it should give us cautious optimism. I, I want to stress both of those words, caution and optimism. We have to stay vigilant and continue to learn as we go. I do think we're learning how to do what we aspired to do, which is to be together, to create community remotely and here, successfully under pandemic. Uh, three important updates since we last met. We have, as you know, completed our phased return. In-person learning has begun for those on campus. We've wrapped up the second round of comprehensive testing and are continuing to develop our testing program. To date, we've completed 7,380 student tests and 805 employee tests, awesome numbers. The results have given us reason to be optimistic. We've had a very limited number of cases on campus. We just ticked over to 10 cumulative student positives over those seven weeks. Still less than 10 on campus employee positives and fewer, sorry, fewer than 10, and fewer than 10 active cases right now on campus. Um, you all know that we, we report only numbers above 10 to protect privacy of individuals. As I said, we're exploring additional testing tools such as wastewater testing to understand how they can add to this vigilant approach. It's critical to remember that no matter how proactive we are with testing, this is only one element of our approach to minimize the risk of COVID-19 spread in this community. And I really want to credit our students as well as our faculty and staff with taking mask wearing and physical distancing from rules to habits, really truly working to create shared norms around them. I think that's in large part 
why we are where we are today, and it's a credit to our community. I think it should be a point of pride that we are learning how to work and learn together successfully under pandemic, and we have to stay humble. Um, I will note that the Provost's latest survey of students shows an incredibly high level of awareness about what's required with these guidelines. Um, but we have to keep holding to them and not use this moment of success as a chance to say, okay, cool, um, we did it, because this is an ongoing effort. We want to be together, and we need to be together to ensure that students can continue momentum to their degrees, and so our incredible staff and faculty can work in the jobs they're so passionate about, so passionate about, and so that William & Mary continues to flourish. I want to, in a larger way, just talk about the challenges we face that are quite real, the intractable budget in the midst of an economic crisis. You will hear more from CEO Amy Sebring. Um, last month, our shortfall expectations will exceed 30 million and may reach as high as 100 million in the months ahead. A shortfall of this scale means that we're going to keep confronting incredibly difficult decisions. We know that, and so I ask that William & Mary hold to our mission, vision, and values as we affirm them that fall, last fall, that we bring together extraordinary human beings to advance knowledge and to meet the most pressing needs of our time. As challenging as this moment is, we're seeing really profound growth in this organization. Um, stretches, growing pains, true, but really profound growth. There isn't going to be a snapback to 2019 ever, and we're beginning to explore what that means. I want to wrap up with three important through lines for that growth that I'm seeing. One is, I think, the potential for a deeper sense of citizenship. The, even in the small ask of going up to somebody you don't know to say, do you have your mask with you? or even in the moment in which that ask comes to you, hey, I see you forgot your mask, take giving and receiving that kind of request for change behavior with respect is something that is going to stand us in good stead. Those are muscles that we need as a nation. At a time of toxicity, young people are calling themselves into respectful discomfort with one another. We're really seeing that across the campus in so many ways. And these small acts are going to make us stronger as citizens and as a community. Second through line is the affirmation of complexity and nuance. This is a core commitment of my presidency. We'll hear more about this with the Working Group for Principles on Naming and Renaming. They are giving us a powerful model for listening across generations and for processing deeply held and deeply divergent views. It's been incredibly hard work, but I, I so, I'm so grateful for the aim of cultivating truly inclusive community and the listening that Dr. Buck and his colleagues on that working group have done over the last three months. We'll hear a little bit more about that later this morning. The third through line, I think, uh, is just core, and that is humility. We do not have all the answers. No one does. I'm echoing something the rector said. We're building the muscles to do things we've not done before in so many different ways. Knowing this, we are going to work at the end of the semester in a planned after action review, build time for organizations and individuals at William & Mary to reflect on what we've done, how we would adjust it going forward in preparation for the spring. And in academic units usually have the opportunity to do this, non-academic units usually don't. We, I'm working with um, our chief human resources officer to figure out how we can build that same capacity for a self-assessment, after action review, and planning into the working lives of non-academic units. So more through lines to talk about as we go forward, but I did want you to know that we are always thinking big picture and long term, even as we're grappling with really intense crises. So thank you so much, all of you. Um, we're in the middle of charting what the next chapter is for the alma mater of the nation, and I'm incredibly grateful to be in these conversations with you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board?
Catherine, um, I did read um, your email the other day or your notice that um, uh, General uh, Jim Golden is working um, with the athletic department. And I assume, I know that the general was previously um, our, um, our vice president for Stre strategic advancement and has been advising you ever since. I assume he's doing that work uh, on, uh, as a volunteer, is that correct? Yes, um, that's an unusual thing about William & Mary, that uh, folks who have had long service have stayed on to work as volunteers in really active and wonderful ways. Um, it's not something I was familiar with before coming here, but I'm incredibly grateful for it. Wonderful, thank you. We, we never let you go. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that's you. the plan. Uh, um, Sam Jones, for example, right. Yeah. Anyone else? Excellent. Um, Dr. Saito, welcome. And uh, I, I, all of the comments that I made about the planning for um, coming back uh, were, of course, uh, directed at you as, as you at well. Um, your team has done an awesome job. It's a smaller campus, and you are a little bit more isolated, so that may be good or bad. Um, but I think it's you know just remarkable all the work that went into ensuring that everyone will be safe there and, and you know you have fewer buildings so it's a little harder in some ways to do that uh, but you build a great team and i know that they um, rose to that challenge like they have in the past so look forward to hearing a little bit about that so welcome thank you mr rector i'm debbie sido president of richard bland college and as was detailed by our students faculty and staff at tuesday's richard bland college committee meeting the new academic year that launched on August 24th within the structure and protocols of Statesmen Safe and Secure is off to a remarkably strong start as we end week five of this semester. RBC student representative Sarah Moncure astutely observed in her report to the board that, quote, students have shown immense resilience and creativity as they keep school spirit and participation alive. And I would say they're doing that in some very creative ways with online clubs and other activities that observe our physical distancing regulations. Sarah described the collaboration between and among students, faculty, and staff to achieve a new normal that retains the essence of academic and extracurricular engagement from prior years. Our faculty representative to the board, Dr. Tiffany Birdsong, highlighted innovative instructional practices that are using technologies in new ways to academically engage students in an online or hybrid environment. From podcasts being used in new ways to live polling to engage students in real time to new teaching methods and modes our faculty have stepped up to the challenge of honoring RBC's promise to deliver an exceptional student experience, even in the midst of a pandemic. Also, also, I'm very proud of the administrative team that has not missed a beat in achieving priority strategic goals this year. So we talk a lot about the COVID environment, but it's important to keep in mind we're still early in our strategic plan. We're in year one of our new strategic plan. And our team has remained very focused on achieving the goals of that plan. In addition to securing competitive awards from the American Council on Education's Learner Success Lab to continue to move the dial on student retention and advance RBC's unique GPS Guided Pathways program, We've also, um, RBC Online is a brand new program or line of business, if you will, and that program is ready to launch in January. I think all of you know and have heard about the extensive research that is undergirding that plan. This program, which is based on uh, both internal and external research, is central to RBC's sustainability efforts. As our new program initiatives like the Faculty Early Retirement Incentive Plan that was introduced to the RBC Committee on Tuesday. And uh, just a note that we will be seeking uh, board approval of that plan in November in order to launch the Voluntary Retirement Plan 
in FY22. As President Rose stated, COVID-19 is posing challenges for all of higher education, and RBC is certainly not exempt from that. So stated succinctly, our team is dually focused on new revenue generation through initiatives like the new online program and at the same time cost savings through continuous assessment of operational efficiency and effectiveness. Perhaps the very best evidence of success on this front is SAC COC board action earlier this month to reaffirm Richard Bland College's accreditation through 2029. Reaffirmation of accreditation is a significant milestone in the life of any institution, and for RBC, achieving this designation was hard earned. In summary, there is much to celebrate at Richard Bland College despite the vagaries of 2020. We appreciate Chairman Branch, Vice Chair Johnson, Rector Littell, and the board's recognition of our team's efforts by hopefully approving a Statesman Safe and Secure Employee Recognition Day resolution to be pre presented later in the meeting. Your acknowledgement, recognition, and support uplift us and sustain us, particularly now in this time of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. We appreciate you and all that you have done and will do to keep RBC healthy, relevant and strong, despite the headwinds that we and indeed all institutions of higher education are now facing as we rapidly respond and evolve to new social, economic, and market conditions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, President Saito, and uh, um, thank you for reminding me about the uh, uh, SACS accreditation. That's really remarkable work that occurred, um, obviously, uh, thousands of hours before the, the process, but following up on that and really uh, moving the needle, and that obviously had been a priority for the board, and we appreciate, you know, all the people that really stepped up. We appreciate Amy Sebring uh, involvement in that, but really it was a great accomplishment to move that forward. So thank you. Any questions for President Saida? All right, well, let's get into the business part of our meeting. Um, before we do that, we have minutes from our virtual meeting on August 3rd and our in-person meeting on August 25th. Hopefully you all have had a chance to read the, those minutes. Do you have a motion to approve those? So moved. Second. Second. Mr. Fox? Aye. 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 Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Roday. Aye. Ms. Schultz. Aye. Mr. Watkins. Aye. Director. All right. Those the motions carry. Thank you. Um, just as a, a reference point for anyone who's listening on the phone, um, normally we we are a formal. Uh, body and we follow a bunch of rules and uh, uh, sometimes seem very rule-based. Um, but we have additional requirements because of the um, uh, allowances that were made uh, for COVID that allow board members to participate. So instead of having uh, voice votes, we have to have a roll call vote for everything. So um, th that is the reason for that. All right, we're going to move into the reports of our committees. And we will start with uh, the Committee on Academic Affairs, Ms. Schultz. Yes. Dr. Schultz. Uh, yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm Karen Schultz, uh, Chair of the Academic Affairs Committee. And on behalf uh, of uh, Vice Chair Doug Bunch, we um, give profound thanks to the faculty, staff, students, and leadership of William and Mary during these unprecedented times. I acknowledge the work and the effort of of our staff to keep us safe and yet achieving, learning, growing during this time. So thank you very much. Um, we appreciate uh, uh, Provost Peggy uh, uh, Agros' report and um, thank you very much for the topics that are um, well documented. 
At this time, we do have some guests uh, for the academic affairs, and I would like to tur uh, turn to uh, Professor Emeritus George Greenia, who has a very exciting announcement about our Phi Beta Kappa. So, um, Dr. Greenia, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate being here, especially seeing so many old friends. Um, I'll pick up a number of themes from our rector and president, including um, those who are supposed to be retired, uh, <laughs> still being on, on duty. Um, I'm Professor Emeritus. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm George Greenia from Modern Languages. I've actually been out for four years. I'm having what many of my colleagues call a failed retirement. Um, I also speak to you today <clears throat> as a former six years um, member of the executive committee of Phi Beta Kappa Senate, its, its board of trustees, board of visitors, and as an officer of Alpha Chapter of Phi Beta Kappa here at William and Mary. And <clears throat> what I bring you today is nothing but good news, which you don't have to do anything about yet. And the good news includes that it's not going to cost you anything yet. <laughs> and actually, we anticipate it's going to work in much the other direction. We have just come off of two major anniversary celebrations, 50 years of black students in residence on our campus and 100 years of women. Those were wonderfully planned and wonderfully executed events that really made the entire community proud. Those who live on campus, those who are alumni and live off of campus, the entire community that surrounds us was proud of those events. And we can be proud of them as gone down in our history of William and Mary in service to the nation. But the big one anniversary is still coming up. And that's not California speak for something <laughs> terrible about to happen. The big one is really uh, 2026. When we celebrate the 250th anniversary of the birth of our nation, of Phi Beta Kappa here at William and Mary, one of our gifts to the nation, of the first fully constituted and property black church here in Williamsburg, the first Baptist church, which is significant, all 250 years from 1776, and the same year, 2026, we'll see the 100th anniversary of Colonial Williamsburg itself. This is going to be huge. And actually, even though I talk about 2026, it's an arc of at least two years of active full-time programming, 25, 26. And actually, we have been planning for two years already in the national offices of Phi Beta Kappa for a rollout of continuous programming starting very soon through 2026. So even though it seems a long way, a time away, I think it's going to be huge. And I'm gonna give you the punchline now twice. First, speaking on behalf of Phi Beta Kappa as a national organization founded here at William & Mary, but now at 290 campuses across America, every prestige school that you could name, we intend in 2526 that Williamsburg will be the epicenter of a national conversation on the liberal arts and sciences as the foundations of democracy itself. I'll say it again as a member of this community. We hope that in 2526, Williamsburg and William and Mary in particular will be the epicenter of a national conversation about the liberal arts and sciences as the foundations of democracy itself. This is our heritage, not just as Phi Beta Kappa, but as William and Mary. We are the alma mater of a nation, not just because famous people walked across our campus, but because the values of education have been sustained here and have written, risen to not just national, but planetary prestige. What does William and Mary bring to this? Enormous things. What does Colonial Williamsburg, and we're already working with Colonial Williamsburg, obviously on this at the national level, from Phi Beta Kappa's offices in Washington, D.C. There's only three uh, cities in America that can claim to be the landscapes of the founding of this nation. 
Those are Boston, Philadelphia, and Williamsburg. Frankly, we've got the better setting right here. We've got the props, we've got the costumes, we've got the fife and drums court. We've got a tradition and a mechanism and a foundation to educate the nation on liberal arts and sciences as the foundations for democracy itself. Democracy itself was discussed here by William and Mary students from December 5th, 1776. Phi Beta Kappa also brings a certain convening authority, which is important for us for convening that conversation, for bringing it forward to a national level. We've got 290 daughter chapters across the country. During this 2526 arc, they will be satellite sites for continuing this conversation. Programming that we'll develop here in conjunction with the provost, certainly the dean of the law school, and many other factors across campus. The program we develop will become models and templates to share with other campuses around the nation. It will go out to Princeton, to Yale, to Stanford, to Michigan and Illinois, to Charlottesville and Chapel Hill. They're younger schools, we should give them a hand. They will certainly layer on their own local programming appropriate to their institution and history, but the marquee events will happen here in Williamsburg. The lar think the largest names in American political and cultural life will be coming to Williamsburg. The financial pa package, um, we will be working with, of course, Matthew Lambert, with Earl Granger, with our team at Phi Beta Kappa in Washington, D.C., about donor cultivation. This will excite a lot of people um, who will want to buy in and support the activities that happen in 24, 25, 26. Corporations and foundations also will have major buy-in interests for supporting the activities that we host here in Williamsburg and on our campus. Um, and um, actually there's a state appropriation for celebrating the 250th anniversary that's already in works in the General Assembly. And we need coordination among our various agencies to make sure that that goes smoothly as well. An appropriation that has already talked about being expanded because of the collaboration of Phi Beta Kappa, of Colonial Williamsburg, and hopefully of William and Mary itself. We've been talking for over two years, but actually this is the first time we're presenting it in public, and it seems appropriate that we address it to William and Mary's Board of Visitors now. If there's any question I can answer, I'd be happy to do that, but I want to leave you with the last image, and that's putting aside, as Matthew Lambert mentioned yesterday, a misplaced modesty about who we are. As I travel around the country and visit other campuses, hoping, aspirant institutions, hoping to secure a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, which is actually the last major form of credentialing an institution can receive, presidents, college presidents, take me aside and tell me, we hope to be the William and Mary of Missouri. Or more confidently, we consider ourselves the William and Mary of Nebraska. It's because of Phi Beta Kappa, in part, that we have outreach to other campuses and a prestige moment that we can use for the benefit of the nation. Stillwater, Oklahoma, when we installed their chapter, after working, they working for their campus and their university for 33 years to secure a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, to process into their hall, representing William and Mary and the Alpha chapter, and to see 18 feet high on their main screen, the Wren Building. The, the aspiration to be part of the William and Mary story is a national story. And we will be the epicenter of a national conversation about the liberal arts and sciences as the foundations of democracy itself. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rania, thank, thank you for updating us and uh, uh, continuing to update us through this. And uh, your enthusiasm and your planning are, are obvious, and uh, we appreciate that, and we look forward to being as supportive as possible. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Schultz will keep us 
uh, in the loop as, as things progress. So we appreciate that. I will tell you, you're not going to get a lot of sympathy. We, too, are comrades in volunteer service to William & Mary. Um, but we do honor uh, the work that you are continuing to bring and the service that you bring. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and uh, remarks. Um, I would um, now like to tur turn to one of the jewels of uh, William & Mary, uh, which is um, the, um, our Highland um, campus. And would um, Sarah Bonhopper uh, has brought two guests that we um, welcome. We're so happy to have you here, um, George Monroe and Jennifer um, Stacy. And we will be hearing a little bit about um, Highland. So um, can you join us? And welcome. Thank you so much for making the uh, making the trip. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Schultz. I'll cue up um, the real conversation, which will come from our guests, Jennifer and George. Um, but it's my, my privilege and my pleasure to set the stage to, to share the essence of what we do. Um, we've put a timeline together, um, a total of three slides, just to give you a sense of what we've been working on for the last several years. Um, our journey started when Highland announced the results of our research, um, finding the actual main house on the property and correctly identifying the standing house, which is actually the presidential guest house. And shortly thereafter, George contacted Highland and said, you know, I think we have a connection and maybe we should meet. And it really began there. Shortly thereafter, um, I was introduced by a mutual friend to Mrs. Ada Monroe Saylor, who is Jennifer's mother. And uh, we started putting all the pieces together and have been working together since. Um, there are several crucial pieces in the story that we've developed. Um, one is the National Summit on engaging descendant communities and teaching about slavery that was held at Montpelier um, with the help of the National Trust. And that piece is really the essence of our work. The idea that at historic sites and at museums, the directors, the curators, the decision makers are not always and not usually members of the communities that have been so impacted by the history that we research and interpret. And so in order to make that right, descendant communities are asked to be full partners, to work together first, and I think most importantly, in relationship, in research, and in public interpretation. And we set that um, scene at Montpelier at that national summit and have really been working on that essential piece ever since. We have had um, numerous meetings. We've had good publicity nationally and even internationally. And we can move to the next slide. And we have um, formed a portion of William and Mary's um, million dollar Mellon grant, which formally created the Descendant Advisory Council of which Jennifer and George are members. Um, our work together is essential in creating the narratives that we tell to the public. In our community-facing portion of William and Mary, we are constantly engaging in um, helping people in the world of public history to understand our past and how it impacts our present. And the Descendant Advisory Council uh, make up members who are are truly uh, contributing not just to what we tell, but how we tell it. And I want to be clear that this isn't limited to family histories, although we do include um, and, and continue oral histories, um, but all of the work we do, um, we ask our advisors and collaborators to vet and contribute in this way. Um, in the final slide, um, and moving forward, our intent is to continue our engagement 
with campus. Um, we have a Lemon Project porch talk coming up. George has graciously agreed to help with strategic planning. We will continue oral histories. The Mellon Grant um, postdoc, the postdoctoral research fellow, um, will also do some teaching here on campus um, that engages Highland and engages the concept of shared authority for the histories that we tell. And uh, George and Jennifer have both um, offered to both make remarks and answer your questions. So for the, for the real essence, I, I, I turn it over to, to Jennifer Stacy and then George Munro. Good morning and thank you for having us. Um, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to talk about the work we've been doing and I think that one of the um, difficult pieces for me is just, um, I think I'm more of a doer and less of a, you know, how's this impacting, how's this, how's this um, falling on the community. I'm just, I'm kind of, we're in it and, and then it rolls and I think that it's a good time to have to reflect on what we've been doing and I think Sarah gave you the short version of how this came to be and I think I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the fact that I'm a firm believer and it came to be because it was supposed to be and um, it, you know my mother meeting a friend of Sarah without even knowing Sarah or her connection to um, Highland which we grew up as uh, Ashlawn so you'll sometimes hear me interchange the two but um, is that was meant to be and I will often tell the story about how my mom goes to the grocery store to socialize and I think that's kind of probably how they met so um, and then George um, reaching out to to Highland um, we grew up probably about I think maybe 11 miles maybe less from Highland we grew up there our whole lives so we had to travel the road past there and looking at home of James Monroe, Ashlawn home of James Monroe, knowing that my grandfather's last name was Monroe, my mother's maiden name was Monroe, there was this um, connection that we never acknowledged, or at, at least our family really didn't acknowledge it regularly. And so um, years later to have the opportunity to actually go there, to be at Highland, to sit there and work on the, um, you know, on the committee that is shaping the reinterpretation is is profound and, and 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 we never thought we'd be there and to sit there with um, I'd say four generations to discuss um, how this moves forward is an opportunity of a lifetime and I think of my 80 year old mother and um, her the impact has had on her and her friends and our other family members to be able to sit there and share memories that I know have been closed to her for the majority of her life. She never talked about Jim Crow. She never talked about um, wondering what her ancestors did on Highland. Um, and to have those conversations and also to have the opportunity to share those conversations with the rest of not only the community that we, you know, that in, in um, Charlottesville, and, but the world actually, because there is an interest and um, it is make, starting to make an impact and um, to have people question, um, you know, wh what are your thoughts? What do you believe happened? What do you know? What was shared? These are opportunities to educate the world and to have the dialogue that probably should have started a long time ago. But again, I'll go back to the fact that I believe that we are where we are now because we're supposed to be. And so... Um, the opportunity, uh, the, other, the other opportunity that we've had, I remember sitting in one of our committee meetings discussing where we wanted to go forward and one of the pieces that we brought to the table was how do we engage the next generation to really um, understand um, where we've come from and where we want to go and how do we get them engaged and excited about it and once again the opportunity came up to engage the next generation. And we never understood that it was going to be here at um, William and Mary. So the opportunity to engage with the student population here, when we met um, Alton and Olivia, John, Sally, um, and um, it was, 
it was, and I'm leaving out a, na a name, and I'm, that's my menopause memory, so I'm sorry about that. Um, it, it was absolutely wonderful because they brought this energy and this desire to know more about what was going on and this openness to understand that this is impactful and that this is important and that, that Highland had engaged with the enslaved community to better understand how to reinterpret the site and how to bring authenticity to the project and that we had been doing um, we had been doing the work. And so we understood then that we actually had a problem with, um, and I hate to use a term, but PR, to let people know we had been doing work and people deserve to know more about it. And so we hope to have the help of the students to bring that um, message, not only to William and Mary, but to continue to bring the message um, to the world. And this is, the timing is right, because our, we, you know, it, it's, it's often easy to say, oh, we've come a long way, and we have, but we realize now in this moment that we have so much further to go. And I think that this is a wonderful opportunity to use our relationship that we've been building over the last few years to, to continue to bring the discussion and the conversation to where it really needs to be in order to affect some change. So I'm gonna turn it over back to George. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is George Monroe, Jr. And um, I am a descendant of enslaved persons at Highland. And I stand before you humbly. And um, I'm gonna you know, kind of channel my, my, cousin, my cousin Jennifer that you know, we have an opportunity here to kind of give voice to the voiceless, uh, which would be our ancestors. Um, I, wanna, I, I won't take up a whole lot of time, but I want to echo a lot of what my, my cousin said. You know, uh, the interaction with Highland has given us an opportunity to not only, um, you know, address some of the kind of themes that you're seeing in the national conversation around race and equity, but it's also given us an opportunity to think about what are the next steps and how do you actually start to solve for a very complex problem, okay? Um, I would like to say that, you know, the concept of race, the concept of social justice and things of that nature has been a can that's been kicked down all through American history. And I think that um, our interaction as descendants and working with the Highland Plantation gives us an opportunity to, to, to really uh, be a beacon and be at the forefront of this conversation. You know, and really taking a look at things like um, authentic truth telling. You know, how do you tell the proper truths of the enslavement period and how it impacted not only just that current generation that went through that, but the subsequent generations that follow and how that plays out in the fabric of American society, which becomes really huge. Okay. The other piece that it helps us with is, is thinking about how do we you know, tackle these complex histories with integrity. I see our interaction with Highland as being a microcosm, again, for the broader conversation in terms of being able to serve as a, a beacon for other descended communities that are also on that same journey, um, to be able to tell a complete history to where both sides are articulated, so that way when folks are faced with these truths, they can make a decision for themselves in terms of how they want to handle that truth and then make any sort of adjustments that they need to make in their own individual lives. Um, the other piece that I think is also very important is being, uh, again, being about uh, being authentic, okay? This authenticity is something that I think, for, for the most part, is largely missing, all right, and, and really confronting history. For example, there's so much more research to be done um, when you think about the area that our family is from by the name of Blenheim, you know, there's tons of research that could be done there in terms of understanding one of the more uh, first free, co free communities of, of African Americans uh, in this country uh, and being able to go there and learn to see how they were able to uh, survive in, in, in instances of uh, un un unbridled sort of racism and, 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 and discrimination and disenfranchisement, right? So uh, our work with Highland is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. I think that there's a large, uh, a large opportunity, not only for us to influence the local history, but also American history and to be able to um, pull threads for um, uh, additional areas of research that are largely unknown about the African-American experience. 
you know, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of times the African-American experience begins with slavery, begins with chains on us, but then it moves quickly to the civil rights movement. Okay, so how do you take a whole group of people who couldn't, for the most part, read or write, and then how do they actually take a, a miss, uh, you know, discriminatory laws and, 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 and racial uh, constructs, how do they then kind of birth themselves into a nation within a nation and then be able to produce future generations of doctors, lawyers, entrepreneurs, um, professors even, authors, right? That's a story that's waiting to be told. And we have that experience right within, our, with, right within the context of our family. And that my grandfather, Ned, uh, he was enslaved. He worked on many of the plantations in the surrounding area. He couldn't read or write, but he was able to amass acreage. He was able to grow and, and raise 15 children, 16 children that we know of. And now looking five to six generations later, you know, you have, you have doctors walking around, you have, you have entrepreneurs, you have businessmen, you have educators, you have professionals. That's the story that needs to be told. How, did, how, do, how are we able to do that? Okay. So uh, again, I, I thank you, uh, uh, all of you, for the opportunity to be here today. And, and uh, at this particular time, we're open to any questions that you might have. Thanks. Are there any, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Schultz. Uh, I, I just want to thank Jennifer and this is, uh, sorry, Will Payne. I want to thank uh, Jennifer and George. Uh, we talked this summer on a few occasions and I updated my colleagues on the board uh, regarding their role in being a bridge between Highland and the university. And, and so I do want to thank Jennifer and George for coming together with William Mary students this summer and since then to discuss how we, you know, all of us can use Highland and the experience of their ancestors to do something no one else is doing in America with the presidential property. Um, and I, I commend their vision, um, you know, to make Highland more visible to students early in their time at William Mary and share uh, more broadly the uh, impactful work Highland is doing with uh, descendant collaborators to present a truthful and inclusive history. And I look forward to, to growing that relationship. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Um, any, yes. This is Barbara Johnson. I'd just like to thank our guest for your role in allowing Highland to help tell the story of enslaved people whose stories have never been told before. I can't tell you how personally important I think that the work you are is. is. I am curious as to whether you've used any DNA testing to attempt to actually determine where the Monroe descendants came from in various African countries. So great question, first off. Um, one of the things that uh, we both want to kind of, you know, kind of true back to is the importance of oral history. Uh, in, our, in our family, there is oral history that talks about um, some of the progenitors of the Monroe family within Virginia. Um, James Monroe has come up um, and something that we haven't validated specifically yet by actual evidence DNA, but it is something that we're working towards. Um, in terms of the DNA kind of driving the, the broader conversation, um, I personally have gotten my DNA done and I am 30% European, believe it or not. Uh, you know, looking at uh, breakdowns in, in England and Wales and uh, Norway and Sweden, kind of that block, and then of course the, the remaining components of me are 70% uh, African uh, in Nigeria. Um, I think that DNA, DNA should be something that's broadly uh, explored um, because when I go up to someone, say someone that looks a little bit different than I do, say Caucasian Americans or, or white Americans, and I say, hey, well, you know what, guess what, I'm 30% white. That changes the conversation right then and there, right? Because they're like, hmm, that's interesting because now what we're starting to do is break down, uh, break down um, silos, so to speak, right? Especially if I can uh, pinpoint to the exact area in Europe that my family may potentially have come from. Um, the other piece is, too, is it's kind of hard to hate what's a party, right? So when I look at this fact that I'm made up of all of this different kind of, you know, kind of components of uh, ethnicities and all of that good stuff, it makes for an interesting story, number one. And then secondly, it helps me to broaden my worldview, okay? 
Um, just kind of give you an example when this, this pandemic thing lifts. I plan on doing a backpacking trip in Ireland and Scotland to understand where the last name Monroe comes from, right? So um, when we think about the whole concept of DNA, DNA I think becomes very important in terms of uncovering histories and, 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 um, and, and, and basically also showing that, you know what, African Americans are just not from Africa. You know, um, there, there, there is an untold stories, a bunch of untold stories, whether it be from Jefferson and his relationship with Sally Hemings and to other men, prominent men back during those times, that they did have interactions with these enslaved peoples. And therefore, we are here, right, as a, as a byproduct of that relationship. So um, thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes. First, again, this is powerful. So thank you so much, Ms. Stacy and Mr. Monroe, for being here. Um, and, and like Ms. Johnson said, I also take this work personally, especially um, regarding this campus and our trajectory in that history. Um, and I think about how this university empowered President Monroe for better and for worse. And I think about what we can do now, and I think this relationship building is very important. But I guess my question is, what can we do more to empower you, the descendants, to tell your story and to help to reconcile and repair um, 300 plus years of trials and tribulations that we have forced you to endure? Well, I think the fact that this is an academic community is um, where the help of William and Mary comes in because you help get, you help the, with the education piece. And I think our um, ability to educate the students will go a long way. And that's the, the, that's the piece that keeps giving. And um, that and just continued support um, for the project and patience to see it through because I believe that it's going to be something incredible, so. Yeah, and I think, I think the only thing I would add to that is um, being a research institution, I think thought leadership. You know, um, we, you know, we have an opportunity, um, we're blessed to have, you know, of course myself and other family members to include my cousin Jennifer as being like, you know, kind of budding genealogists and family historians. But, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, there's resource pools that we don't necessarily have access to that William and Mary could actually help us with in terms of primary and secondary source information on some of the themes that we're uncovering. Like I said earlier, you know, we have a, an extensive oral history for our family, but you know, the goal of any historian is, is to validate that against any sort of primary and secondary source information, right? So with William & Mary's resources and, and connections and network, it'd be great to be able to partner in, in, that, in that regard to be able to pull that information to tell a more broader and complete story that can be validated. Thank you. Um, Are you done, Adrian? Any more? Okay. Um, Dr. Schultz. I, Dr. I just, Dr. Schultz, I, I do have. Um, one, I, I would just like to add my uh, appreciation, not just for being here today. I know it's not the easiest uh, place to get to sometimes, but especially for your involvement and initiative. Um, you know, grassroots endeavors are often the most successful and the longest uh, activities that we can be involved in, and that initiative is, is really important. I also do want to recognize uh, Dr. Sarah Von Hopper um, because without her in the middle of this, a lot of this stuff would, would not have happened and we really appreciate um, the work that she's done both from an academic uh, and research perspective as well as an interpersonal relationship perspective. Um, we all have followed your story, um, the timeline that, that uh, Dr. Von Hopper shared, um, so it's really great to meet you in person. I wish we could embrace you without masks and, and thank you for being here and hope that we'll be in engagement with you. Um, but as uh, AJ uh, uh, sort of referenced, you know, our connection to each other is, is through James Monroe, through our alumnus here. And, uh, you know, we have spent a lot of time talking about, you know, how do you contextualize people like that? How do you look at all the good things that they did? Um, and how do you look at the things that were not so good? Um, we have referenced, I've referenced uh, Dr. Nick Gordon-Reed and this notion of taking the good with the bitter and being honest about that. You talk about truth-telling. So any thoughts about, you know, how we continue to do that? I know that you, you all are doing a great job of helping to tell the story at Highland. We need to tell that story here as well. So 
love to hear your, your perspective on that. I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of one thing that, um, that we, you know, that we are in the midst of too. Um, it's the story about the, fi the families, the selling them in families, which for me, I use this as kind of a symbol of the complexity of, of James Monroe and of being uh, an owner of slaves. Um, because I think in that story, there's, there's incredible complexity. You have the situation where it is brutal to sell a person, but in that brutality, you have them selling, trying to keep them together as a family. And so um, the work that we're doing with the connection in Florida, we had an opportunity to meet um, one of the family members from Florida, and it was, and she's a part of our, um, communi our community, our, our committee. And it's, it was surreal. I can't even begin to explain what it was like to meet someone whose family was there with ours and who was sold away from the community and then to be re reacquainted all these hundreds of years later. It was incredible. And so I just wanted to, to um, kind of bring that up to say that yes, um, it is a complex um, story and it is, um, you know, a. Um, a uh, difficult thing to to um, to admit, to embrace, to to deal with, but we can deal with it, and the fact that we have started and that we are dealing with it from an authentic, truthful place, is important because we can't erase the fact that there that James Monroe was a plantation owner, that Highland was a plantation. It's real. It's the beginning of one part of my story here in this world. And same for George and other descendant um, um, family members. And so to pretend that away is not something that we want to do. We want to jump right in the middle of the messiness and work to get to a place where we all can be proud. So thank, thank you. Any other questions, sir? Yeah. Mr. Director. Uh, yes. Uh, could you, I'm Charles Poston, could you talk a little bit about your interaction with students? How often? What do they do with you? Uh, ethnicity of the students, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. So um, we had an opportunity to engage um, Alton, Olivia, John, and Sally. Uh, they're students here, and um, it was mostly kind of birthed out of um, I believe there was a petition that was floated this summer, and so we wanted to use that as an opportunity for them to kind of understand who we are and the work that we are performing. And, and, and as Jennifer said earlier, that has actually become a, a, a true blessing in terms of the passion and the energy that they bring. Um, when we were able to provide them with additional context in terms of some of the goals and objectives of the descendant community, they were all in. And then it switched from kind of like thinking about, okay, um, kind of what I would say, just kind of being transparent, operating off of pieces of misinformation. And when they got the whole picture, they wanted to help us in our overall journey. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with a student um, probably about two months ago by the name of Alton, uh, Alton Serling, and he, uh, he met me in Charlottesville where I'm originally from. And we had a chance to go tour Monticello together. We then went and did a tour with, with, uh, with Sarah down at uh, Highland. And um, I, 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 I cherish that moment because I'm able to, as, you know, of course, as a, as a I, would, I would guess you would call it a middle-aged African-American male at this point, even though I feel like I'm 28 inside. Um, I had a chance to really sit down and talk with Alton and talk about his goals and his hopes and how William and Mary is helping him get to, to where he needs to be. Um, and in addition to that, you know, it was, it was inspiring to me to kind of see his hopes and dreams still in front of him while also tackling the hard truths of race and what he's thinking about in terms of his life path, right? So, you know, when we think about um, the, the student uh, community that we're working with, like, I couldn't be more impressed with them. I mean, they're, they're intellectually, intellectually curious. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, they think really well in white space, meaning, you know, they, we, we put out a complex problem out there and we think, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? And they're able to strategically start to think things through, right? And I think that becomes a, a testament to the education that they're, that, that they're receiving here as critical thinkers, right? And so I think that um, our engagement with them is just at the beginning. And I think that we're kind of locked in step. And so they bring fresh ideas, fresh perspectives that would allow us in terms of kind of broadening our... Um, our descendant community kind of approach. So, I don't, anything else? I, 
I believe part of your question was, what is the, uh, is it diverse, is it a diverse? Um, Helena is a Caucasian young woman. Um, I'd say Olivia and Alton, they d identify themselves as black uh, women and men and John as well, I believe. But I think that it goes a little bit deeper because when I look at faces and when we think about the DNA that we've uncovered, there's probably a lot there. And I think there are, there are also other students that are interested. We just haven't seen their faces yet, but we've heard about their, their desire um, to engage. So um, we're pleased that um, to be working with them. It is the most, it's just, it's, it's exciting. And George, I agree with George, they just bring this perspective that is, um, that is uh, that's very positive, it's very um, inquisitive, and it's not, and you know, it started out at a real, a critical place. They were, they were up in arms about, about this whole project, and then it moved to a place where they listened. They, um, they had open minds. They started to actually say, have you thought about X, Y, and Z? Have you thought about how we could get the word out? And then they not only th talked about this, they went into action, and they did it quickly. And they continue to come up with um, strategic ideas, and they want to meet regularly. So that's, that's, in, that's invaluable. We're, we're so excited about the relationship now. So. Cynthia, you had a question? I was simply going to speak at the same time to this matter of engagement of, the, of, of, of students. I, too, had an opportunity to speak at length with Alton Costin, and he described to me kind of the epiphany, <laughs> uh, as, as I think he described it, that uh, came from his experience and actually speaking with you directly and actually understanding uh, the interrelationships uh, between the slaves, the enslaved and the slave owner, and having not really appreciated before that conversation exactly how much value there is in exploring that. Uh, I happen to, to believe without any academic authority whatsoever or scientific basis, just my own personal belief, that the only way we ultimately overcome racial division and this false racial hierarchy is to engage in just this kind of exercise. And the idea that we could spread this experience well beyond the confines of, of, of this area is very exciting to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering exactly what efforts are there uh, that are on the books or, or on the horizon to, to do that, to make this a, a, a learning experience for others beyond your family. So I'm going to let Sarah speak to that, and bef but before she comes, I wanted to echo the um, the uh, sentiments about Sarah. It is about it was strictly about relationship building, and we didn't all start at the same place with this project. I want to say that before she comes, we had people at totally different areas of whether we engage, and um, and I've been asked before during like panel discussions, you know, can you trust the museum communities, the you know, outside um, communities. And for me, I, I work off my gut. I'm like you, I'm not coming from a place of, of academic um, scholar. I'm, that's not who I am. But what I do know is that Sarah's, Sarah's um, authentic and caring and considerate um, person that she is, that is what built the relationships that have developed out of um, this project, and without that foundation, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't because I, I have stubborn cousins, especially male cousins, and they wanted initially wanted no part of this. Um, and then they, we, it was so it was that is authentic. I mean, we had to get to a place where we all trusted and we all believed, and that trust is at the core of all of this, even with the students. And I'll turn. Back. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, bearing that trust is a, is a solemn thing, and I take that seriously. Um, and to get at the heart of your question, how do we grow the conversation? Um, I see Highland's work sort of having three kind of facets that are faces. Um, one is that public piece, one is the descendant piece, and one is the student piece. And they all combine in different ways. But the work of descendant 
engaged research, teaching, and public interpretation um, as drawn from, as I mentioned, that, that really transformative um, several days at Montpelier talking about engaging descendant communities. That's a really key piece of what we do. For example, when I'm asked to speak about this work, I don't just show up. I extend an invitation. Um, Jennifer and I have um, presented in several venues now, I think starting first at her workplace, Health and Human Services on the Mall in Washington, um, at a lunchtime sustained dialogue meeting. Um, and that was a couple years ago now. And we've spoken at the United States Historical, the U US Capitol Historical Society together again to present this. We presented at Albemarle County, um, you know, focusing on a monument in, in Charlottesville, really the inaugural discussion of that this summer and where Jennifer really was the, the force behind it. And so we, um, I make sure that, that it's not always, even though I'm speaking now, it's not always me at the podium um, and, and trying to demonstrate that in, in everything we do. Um, our new exhibits are thoroughly not just rubber stamped, but vetted and, you know, George, for example, had an idea of, I'd like you to include a little bit more about uh, Liberia, for example, and how that figured into the consciousness and, and so forth in one of our exhibits that we're creating now. And I just got the email from um, the postdoc who's working on the exhibit text and having included that. Um, so really deeply within what we do and then trying to share that out with the world, uh, right? And so that in all the pieces. and. Of course, the irony is scaling that is hard because they are one-on-one -on -one conversations and they really are built on um, a mutual trust and uh, needing to be vulnerable and needing to um, really know each other's um, best interests. So I think we talk about assuming good, good intent, right? And we, in some ways, need to also prove that. But I think doing it, demonstrating it, and talking about it are ways that it can be replicated. Um, and you know, where we saw some of the groundwork at Montpelier um, at that summit, um, that's encouraging other institutions to do the same. And we're already seeing institutions coming to us and saying, how do we do what you're doing? Um, and we will continue talking about it, doing it, and, and trying to, to spread that. So um, like all complex problems, there's not a si single simple solution. But we just keep doing it and keep focusing on those relationships and those processes. Exciting and good to know. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, Karen and, and uh, our guests, um, we're, first of all, that was really great. I mean, we've had lots and lots of conversations about history, and you know, we are a research institute, so it's important to really think about facts and history. But those conversations are very sterile. So to hear the impact to real people, to hear that authentic truth telling is really uh, amazing and, and incredibly valuable. Um, we're going, I know you have other stuff to do, um, but we are going to take a break when we're done this, so if you all can stay, I'm sure there are some board members that might want to just ask you a question or something like that, so it'll be pretty quick, but thank you. Did you want to take a break before we finish the No, I'd, I'd like we'll you to finish. finish. You are setting a record for the <laughs> longest academic affairs report in board history, and uh, but it's it's all it's all good, and you know the academics are rising up. So, Mr. Rector, thank you for those comments. Um, please know of my personal appreciation for your being here, and I'm looking forward to your sticking around for a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Schultz and, and other committee chairs, um, so that we can speed along, we'll just do everything in a block, unless yes. there is a need to separate. Yes. So if you just give a quick uh, yeah. description of each, and then we'll vote on that. Yes, I do. we do have a block of resolutions, um, 8 through 15, that were um, approved in the committee meeting. And I'd like to um, suggest that we move those um, forward um, for um, presentations. Do I um, have such a motion? So yes 
All those. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rector. Mr. Payne. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ambassador Ponte. Aye. Mr. Baig. Aye. Mr. Branch. Aye. Mr. Bunch. Aye. Ms. Girdleman. Aye. Mr. Hickson. Ms. Hudson. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Rode. Aye. Ms. Schultz. Aye. Mr. Watkins. Aye. And Mr. Wolfolk, are you on? No. Okay. Mr. Rector. Um, just as we as we close this meeting, I wanted to make. Um, wonder, excuse do me. Want, do you want to defer that to November, the Washington video? If we may. Um, just wanted to uh, bring forward um, two uh, other items of uh, of interest. Um, I would like to uh, commend the Office of Community Engagement, Rich Thompson, uh, Associate Director. There's a robust uh, effort to get out the vote, uh, nonpartisan, uh, that students are doing, um, and um, appreciate uh, their doing this. Um, lastly, uh, one of the folks that is helping with this, Caleb Rogers, who many of you may remember is a William & Mary graduate, uh, often sat outside faithfully to make sure that we were all behaving, and uh, he has been uh, instrumental in keeping in touch with his um, alma mater. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Rector, I believe that is um, what we have for our agenda. I'm sorry for those who are following us on uh, YouTube. We are taking a quick uh, five or 10 minute break. If you all can take your seats, we're gonna get started. Uh, Rich Blaine. All right, uh, returning to our agenda, uh, we'll hear a report from the Richard Bland College Committee, uh, Chairman Branch. I am here, sir. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Very good. And uh, thank you for taking that break because that would have been a very tough act to follow in that. Uh, last committee meeting wow blown away thank you for that uh presentation uh, mr rector the richard bland committee met on uh tuesday september 22nd uh with the president sado and the leadership team of richard bland college uh, we had a very uh robust agenda um, and i want to take uh this opportunity to thank President Sidow and her leadership team. As she said in her opening remarks, they're five weeks into this semester and things are uh, moving along in spite of all of the challenges that everyone is facing with this pandemic, with the economic crisis and the social unrest. And the leadership of, of her and the team is really keeping um, the campus safe and secure and everyone's following that plan. So thank you, President Sadow, for your strong leadership. I also want to congratulate you, as you indicated, about the SACS accreditation and the warning being lifted and that took disciplined, focused and targeted uh, leadership and thank you for getting that done. Our agenda covered the, the faculty volunteer only retirement plan uh, we got a report from the provost, Dizenberg, about the enrollment. Um, Chief Brown, Jeff Brown, went over the state's safe and secure plan. Um, we've got an update from Paul Edwards on the budget. And uh, Stacy Sokol talked about an exciting distance education initiative that she shared with us. And uh, President Sidow referenced the great um, report we got from the faculty representative professor birdsong and our student representative sarah moncure so it was a very comprehensive and thorough um, uh, committee meeting and um, the actions that we took were regarding the resolutions that were in your pre-read 
So we are prepared, uh, unanimously adopted all of the resolutions and are prepared to present those to this larger board uh, for adoption as well. Okay, uh, so that's a motion uh, from the committee. Is there a second? Mr. Rector, before you do that, there is one hand carry resolution on the statesman. Um, yes. So we want yeah. to include that, Mr. Chairman, resolutions one through four and HC1. Okay. Yes. And did you um, want me to read the resolution, the, the hand carry resolution, or just we want to go ahead and everyone, read that? Everyone has a copy of it, sir. No, and, and, it, and it was described by the president, and I think you all discussed it in committee, so. And we've unanimously adopted it. Okay, so do I have a second? Second. Mr. Aye. Rector? Aye. Mr. Payne? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ambassador Ponte? Aye. Mr. Big? Aye. Mr. Branch? Aye. Mr. Bunch? Aye. Ms. Grodelman? Aye. Mr. Hickson's with us yet? Ms. Hudson? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Judge Poston? Aye. Ms. Rode? Aye. Ms. Schultz? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. All right, the motion carries. Um, and uh, any uh, uh, further information, uh, Chairman Branch or President Sato? No, this is Chairman Branch. Not, none from me, President Sato. Any additional thoughts? No, sir. You did a brilliant job. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I'm, Back. I'm glad that we could uh, uh, have that additional resolution recognize the, the, the fine work that's been done there. Um, and uh, hope that they can have that day off and enjoy it. All righty, uh, moving to the Committee on Administration, Buildings and Grounds, uh, Mr. Payne. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Uh, Will Payne, Chair of the Committee on Administration, Buildings and Grounds. Uh, this year, Ms. Gertelman has joined the committee as Vice Chair along with Mr. Saunders. Ms. Gertelman also serves with me on the Design Review Board. Yesterday's DR, or at Wednesday's DRB meeting, we approved preliminary design for the swim library patio, an inviting location between swim and what will be ISC4 that includes a gathering area, tables, umbrellas, garden, and uh, water feature. Uh, President Rowe joined us for preliminary design approval of Hearth Memorial to the Enslaved, which includes a reimagining of the Jamestown Road entrance a connection to the Legacy Tribute Garden, and an intentional design element of the memorial providing a forward-looking view from a store campus looking toward a new campus. Uh, for the Administration Buildings and Grounds Committee, we welcome back Chris Abelt in his fifth year as our faculty representative, and we have a new student representative, uh, Lonnie Wright, Chief of Staff to Mr. Joseph. Um, Dean John Wells gave us an update on capital projects at VIMS, both in Gloucester Point and on the Eastern Shore. Amy Sebring reported on capital projects on main campus, including Reveley Garden, to be completed by December 2020, which, as you know, sits next to the Legacy Tribute Garden. The Fine and Performing Arts Complex expected to open in 2022. Uh, and we also heard about the Muscarelli Museum renovation coming in 2023. Uh, we welcome Sam Hayes, our new interim chief facilities officer. Sam brings uh, energy uh, direction, expertise, and metrics to the business of facilities management. Not only is he a great leader for our building services, uh, business services, operations, and maintenance, as well as our facilities planning and design uh, construction teams. He's a member of the, the, the design review board and he's helping us make sure we are on time and on budget with our capital projects. Mr. Rector, I bring five resolutions to the board. Resolution five designates the Commonwealth's Division of Engineering and Buildings, DEB, as the university's building official. As a reminder, over the last year, Amy conducted a performance analysis of projects under DEB and our code review team, uh, with uh, DEB turning around reviews in about half the time um, and, our, uh, and, and with this resolution, our president still has the ability to hire a local official as part of the existing management agreement. Resolution six and seven are essentially uh, a pro forma nature. Amy Sebring met with bond counsel from the Department of Treasury in the event that we don't issue our own bonds for whatever reason. Um, we are keeping our options open to issue debt for work that is, still needs to be done on one tried place. 
uh, plus uh, air conditioning from Monroe Hall, which we hope to start next summer. Um, so if we do decide to participate in the state's issuance, Resolution 6 would allow us to reimburse the university for work that may begin on these uh, projects before the state actually issues the debt. And Resolution 7 gives authorization to participate in the state's bond sale, not to exceed uh, $20 million. Uh, two more uh, resolutions. Resolution, we have a hand carry resolution 5R, which I believe is on your desk. It uh, does two things. First, it approves the guidelines on naming and renaming as recommended by the Working Group on Principles of Naming and Renaming. And second, it incorporates these guidelines into the work of the Design Review Board. A little bit of background, the DRB is advisory to the President. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Ms. Gertelman joins me on the DRB and Amy Sebring serves as Vice Chair. Sam Hayes and Susan Kern serve as well as others and others can be added as needed. The DRB oversees design implementation in conformance with the goals and objectives of the Campus Master Plan and Design Guidelines this board initially approved back in 2015. Um, therefore, uh, you know, the body's current guidelines already task it with reviewing any proposed changes to the exterior of any university facility and projects involving statues and monuments. Our work covers the spectrum of design elements and considerations from the type of brick used on a building uh, to all the various stages of a project, including site selection, design intent, schematics, and preliminary design. And, and, and I said anything from bricks to glass to the cupola on the, the roof of this building. Um, we rely on experts to guide us in our decisions, and we take this responsibility seriously. In this case, with PNR, we will essentially be a clearinghouse, a way to ensure a holistic and consistent application of the guidelines as established. Uh, I would like to ask either the president or the rector to make any comments. Thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Rector. I'm delighted to. I first just want to thank the members of the working group on principles of naming and renaming, many of whom are here, for swift and very thoughtful work, very engaged with the community, listening to a wide range of voices, concerns, hopes uh, throughout a multi-stage process. I want to tell you a little bit about what's here and also say for the sake of what. It was important to, co to formulate these principles. What's here is yet again refined one more time from what the working group brought to me to situate these principles within the work of the Design Review Board because one of the strong recommendations of the working group, and it's consistent with the board's interests and mine, is to have a way transparently to engage questions of naming. Um, we haven't in the past had principles, though we have named and renamed buildings for more than three centuries. Uh, in, to my mind, it, our mission, which calls us to advance knowledge and do that through discovery, as we just heard wonderfully in the academic affairs session, also must value belonging, respect, integrity, and flourishing. So it's for the sake of those, both that mission and those values that we strive to reflect our community in all aspects of the university, including our built environment. That's a challenging task. It's a complex task. It's a specific task. It's, it's not, a, not easily generalizable. So having the Design Review Board be the holding space for requests, ideas, and, and validation of this work is going to be incredibly helpful, I think, to William & Mary going forward. It's going to continue as needed, appropriately, the work of reviewing other naming and renaming suggestions when that comes in. And I'll give you a couple of things that I, are in process. Um, its membership will be expanded to reflect the wider range of voices and perspectives that this work requires and the expertise this requires. And I just appreciate so much, again, the approach of nuance, complexity, and measured deliberative reflection that the working group has launched us with, recognizing that the places our students, faculty, and staff work and study and live should represent both the full history of William & Mary and its values today. So you heard both and there, a very complex interweaving. So two campus spaces are brought forward to rename right now because they meet the principles 
that we are proposing today because the figures are known because there's been process, for example, at VIMS <clears throat> and, and real understanding of the history of the individuals. There are two additional actions that I want to talk about here. One is to ask the working group on principles of naming and renaming to contextualize the founding fathers. That's something that the board talked about last session. And I want to say a, mo a few words about what we mean by contextualize at William & Mary, because as you heard with the presentation on Highland, that doesn't just mean put a plaque up. It can mean everything up from put a plaque up to robustly exhibit to pursue in a decade or more of history, as the Lemon Project has. As, as Highland is setting out to do, a much fuller, much more forthright account of our history. Um, I, we have, uh, George, there was one anniversary I don't think you mentioned, which is that in 2023, we're going to have the terse centennial of the Brafferton Indian School. And I I'm, have aspirations for that kind of contextualization for that centennial as well, terse centennial. So I'm going to ask the PNR to bring back an appropriate plan by February that works in that robust way, that really thinks through what are the right modes of contextualization. I've also commissioned, that's a grand word, but I've asked people to research four figures where we need to do more work. So the first is Tolliver. We just haven't gotten to the place yet of being able to say, as we have with the other two names, what we know. Uh, the second are Samuel and Joanna Harris, names uh, proposed by in a student petition this summer. Really interesting question of whether what relationship they might have had with Benjamin Stoddard Ewell. That work is not yet pay, bearing fruit. That is to say, that research has been underway, and we're and it's not it's not showing us definitive relationships yet. But I think it really needs to be finished. And then the fourth is Arthur Matsu, a name brought forward by the PNR, who was a 1920s star of four sports, including the football team, went on to be the first Asian American to quarterback in the NFL, was a coach for many, many years, had multiple careers after that. With the help of um, Lisa Roday, we've identified his descendants, daughter and great-grandchildren. And we are in the process of doing oral history there. Because we are approaching the centennial of the first Asian American students at William & Mary, it would be incredibly powerful to be able to um, pursue a naming honor uh, in his name. So, but more work needs to be done there. <clears throat> uh, I want to say a few words on Ewell, because as I came into this process this summer, it seemed to me that Yule was a logical candidate for renaming, had been proposed and requested. In the process of really thinking through what we know about Yule, my thinking changed. And I, um, I go back to George Monroe's really wonderful formulation about the, the pursuit that we're in here is of the question, how do we express complex histories with integrity? Um, what does that look like? And that's what I think the Design Review Board will be asking ourselves over and over again. <clears throat> so many of you, I'm, I'm new to William & Mary, I didn't know much of that history. Many of you probably know this, but working with um, research by Sean Michael Hoyville on Civil War experiences of William & Mary students and faculty, um, our own Terry Myers, Emeritus Professor, Chancellor Professor of English, a first look at the worst, many of you know that essay, and then a biography, which was a 1984 PhD dissertation by A.W. Chapman and other resources. What I discovered is genuinely um, complex in a way that has integrity. Um, and so I'm not bringing you forward for renaming, but I felt it really important to say some things about why because of that. Um, Yule owned slaves. His family owned slaves. He was a senior military figure in the Confederacy. He impressed in that work, he impressed enslaved and free people in the work of building earthworks around Williamsburg. He was also a ardent unionist. He fought against secession. There are stories that the students at William & Mary were really pissed at him because he fought to prevent them from forming a militia and supporting secession. Um, 
One story that he got himself appointed captain in order to prevent them from meeting. And this comes from student records as I understand it. Uh, he, a after the war, was very strongly in support of uh, reconstruction, emancipation, and suffrage for blacks. Most powerfully for me throughout his life, before and after the war, he was an advocate for education for blacks as well as whites and sought funding from the federal government for that purpose. And there's documentation of that according to um, the sources that I just cited. So I, I find in that the kind of complex history that warrants, actually exactly what warrants contextualization um, to have us think in about these incredibly painful fact that the person who is also the person who multiple times saved the college from extinction, the reason, a key reason why we can sit here today um, has this very difficult history. So, so I'm asking also that um, either the PNR or the Design Review Board think about whether they want more research there. That is, I've just named my best fruits of um, two months, uh, and I might have gotten stuff wrong, but I think that this is a case where contextualization is something that really will stand William and Mary in good stead because it's showing us a version of ourselves that we might not have known. So um, I think that's I think that's where we are right now. Yes. Okay. Procedurally, you were halfway through your motion, so I still have another resolution okay. to cover. Uh, am I moving the previous are, are four you, resolutions? Is the next resolution separate from? It's uh, uh, separate, but. Yeah. No, I think since it was discussed, it would be included. Okay. Uh, but I, I've not discussed that, that resolution yet, HC2. Okay. Should, should I? Sure. Um, and building on what the president said, uh, re uh, resolution uh, is a hand carry re resolution uh, HC2 deals with the renaming of two buildings, one on main campus and one at VIMS. Taking into account the work of the principles of naming and renaming uh, work group chaired by former board member Dr. Buck, the president has made two recommendations. The first is Trinkle Hall, which is named for uh, former Virginia Governor Albert Lee Trinkle, Governor Trinkle signed some of the most pernicious Jim Crow laws in Virginia history, which grew out of and fostered the eugenics movement. The second is Mari Hall on the Vims campus, which was established in 1950 and named for Matthew Fontaine Mari, a native of Spotsylvania County, uh, known as uh, the father of modern oceanography for his work in what is now the U.S. Naval Observatory. However, in 1861, Mari resigned his commission as an officer in the U.S. Navy to return to Virginia and assume a leadership post in the Confederate Navy. Neither Trinkle nor Mari had a special connection to William and Mary. Dr. Buck recently said, by rethinking the design of our campus, we address the disparity of all underrepresented peoples, uh, which includes not only African Americans, but many others. We want to open up and tell the whole story. There's a tremendous number of people who have not been given any credit, given dignity, and were suppressed by rethinking the built environment. We acknowledge the contributions of so many who have gone unrecognized. And uh, the president, I know, just spoke a couple of minutes ago, but as she has said, much progress has been made over the past decade to build a fuller and more accurate narrative of our past, led by the deep and nuanced research of the Lemon Project. More work remains to fully realize William Mary's values of belonging and integrity. Yet because the work to date is substantial, some near-term steps can be thoughtfully advanced. Therefore, in the spirit of the principles of naming and renaming guidelines, the President has recommended Resolution HC2 renaming Trinkle Hall as Unity Hall and renaming Mari Hall at Vims as York River Hall. Mr. Rector, um, if we have several resolutions then, HC2, HC5R, and resolutions 5, 6, and 7. Sorry, the committee makes a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Questions? Great. All those in, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Fox. Aye. 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 Aye.
Mr. Berry. Aye. Mr. Branch? Aye. Mr. Bunch? Aye. Ms. Grudelman? Aye. Ms. Hudson? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Abstain. Judge Poston? Aye. Mr. O'Day? Aye. Ms. Schultz? Aye. Mr. Watkins? Aye. And Mr. Wolfolk, are you there? He is not. Mr. Rector? All right, excellent. Anything else? Mr. Payne? That is all. Okay. Again, I'd also like to express my, ex, uh, express my appreciation to the work group. Um, I know they were all busy and uh, particularly with the COVID restrictions. So a lot of hard work that went on over the summer. Um, and really, I know there was a lot of public input just to work through that is, I can assure you, is very difficult. Um, so I appreciate that. I, I think it's consistent with the board's conversations about um, the various sort of categories of people that we honor and uh, appreciate in particular the contextualization that may occur, um, particularly consistent with the conversation that we had with the Monroe descendants. So thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to the Committee on Student Experience. Ms. Roday. Thank you, Mr. Director. Good morning, all. Uh, the Committee on the Student Experience met yesterday in Leadership Hall. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not begin with a tremendous and heartfelt expression of gratitude for the members of the entire William & Mary community for getting our students back safely to campus. Uh, it is only with the cooperation and diligence of the whole community, uh, including our students. Uh, but I would like to uh, send a special, sh a special shout out to Dr. Ambler and her senior team Maggie Evans at Campus Living, Marjorie Thomas, Student Success, Drew Stelger, Student Leadership and Engagement, uh, Dr. Kelly Crace, Health and Wellness, and Kathleen Powell, Career Development, and all of the members of each of their teams. Um, as this board well knows, the health and wellness of our students has been a long-standing priority of this board. This is Dr. Crace's professional life's work. He and the professionals at the McLeod Tyler Wellness Center have been highly engaged on this issue for years. The convergence of COVID-19, the social unrest brought this summer by the murder of George Floyd, and as we heard on Wednesday evening, the added stress and pain caused by the athletics announcement have created an even more pressing need for the Wellness Center services and we are very grateful to everyone there. At our meeting, we heard from members of Dr. Ambler's team who focused their remarks on COVID-19 related innovations, as well as a student panel who shared their experiences of coming back to campus in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, just a couple of highlights that I think the board would enjoy hearing that I do think will become permanent changes in student affairs. Maggie Evans shared the innovative contactless check-in process for move-in, which uses a QR code and timed arrivals. I know that all future parents will not miss the miles long and hours long wait to move in their students each fall. Uh, Kathleen Powell reported on several innovations, but in particular, uh, I'd like to call out the virtual career and internships Fair. Dr. Crace and his team quickly jumped on the best ways to support the community who are feeling the added stress of the pandemic. In the first program of its kind in the country, the team stood up a virtual wellness center in full that includes telehealth, telemedicine, teletherapy, and wellness programming. This too will be a permanent part of the wellness center moving forward. Erica Margiata, Student Unions and Engagement, shared his team's efforts to make meaningful and enduring physical alterations to spaces around campus that are inviting, socially distant, and fun ways to enhance and create an authentic college experience during pandemic. We've all seen the tents all over campus the colorful Adirondack chairs, and the gorgeous lights that have created gathering spaces in the evenings at Sadler Terrace, Crimdale Meadow, and Sorority Court. The popularity of these efforts has been so apparent that Eric and his team have ordered way more chairs, way more lights, and 
in another, I think, terrific addition that students will enjoy. Hammocks are coming. Um, our student panel confirmed uh, that they did have initial fears and concerns about returning to campus safely, and they all each confirmed that their fears have been well addressed. I'll leave you with one comment from a student. The changes on campus don't feel like Band-Aids. They feel like real lasting change. Mm -hmm. What a terrific testimonial to Dr. Ambler and her team. Thank you, that is our full report. On to the, thank you, Ms. Roday. Uh, moving on to the Committee on Institutional Advancement, Ms. Gertelman. Thank you, Mr. Director. We uh, welcomed our committee um, for the year, including Professor Armstrong, welcome, welcoming back Mr. Armstrong as our faculty representative and Kyle Vasquez as our student representative. We asked, um, and, and we were joined by many other members of the board and guests who uh, enjoyed um, Matthew's walk past in walk, walk through our past nine years of where the campaign started, how we ended, and what was accomplished during those nine years. Um, there were many, many lasting uh, legacies pointed out, uh, most important of which is the number of scholarships created during the, during the campaign that will obviously endure forever and was the main priority of the campaign. So we are, we are most grateful to the advancement team and all that was accomplished. So thank you, Matthew. And please make sure your team is aware that we all appreciate that. Uh, our other item of business is resolution 16 that's included in your packet. And it relates to the Commonwealth uh, created or passed a law that requires all foundations to have their own gift acceptance policy. In the past, we have operated using the foundation uh, gift acceptance policy. And so what's put forward on pages like 109 to the end of your book is our the, the Board of Visitors acceptance policy. And uh, we need uh, to we discuss that. We did not have a quorum, so we did not vote on it in committee. And I therefore move the adoption of Resolution 16. Is there a second? Mr. Fox. Mr. Rector. Aye. Mr. Payne. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Ponte. Aye. Mr. Bay. Aye. Mr. Branch. Aye. Mr. Bunch. Aye. Ms. Girdleman. Aye. Ms. Hudson. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Roday. Aye. Ms. Schultz. Aye. And Mr. Watkins. Aye. All right, the motion carries. Thank you. Any additional business? Ms. Girdleman. Any additional business? Okay. Sorry, no, that right. concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think everybody was present for the ad hoc committee on organizational sustainability and innovation, but uh, Mr. Begg, do you have any comments or Mr. Watkins or Madam Secretary? Yeah. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement for, uh, and thanking you, Mr. Director, for expanding the committee's mission to include diversity and inclusion and um, having a new co-chair, Barbara Johnson. Thank you. All right, the uh, Committee on Audit, Risk, and Compliance. Uh, Judge Poston, I think you're pulling in for the chairman. Will you, will you turn on your microphone? Maybe help. All right, we had a report yesterday from the Director of Internal Audit. Kent talked about the status of the audits uh, now. Uh, the only thing significant is slowed down because of the working for home type of thing, and, and they are also down one person in their office. Uh, he also presented a report of the IT penetration testing. That report was actually done by the consultant who did it. That was for William and Mary and VIMS. We had about a 70, had, we had a number of deficiencies, not too many of those were, were major, but of all the deficiencies reported about 70% have been corrected. Uh, there was some discussion about whether or not we should uh, do a, uh, have a range for penetration testing to be done of the system at uh, Richard Bland College as well, but that was just discussed. 
And the report of the Chief Information Officer on uh, the blackboard data breach that affected some information from the Business School Foundation. Uh, that was not a breach of our, uh, our system. It was a breach of a vendor system that held some of our records. That appears to have been resolved and uh, without any major damage. We also heard, uh, without any damage really, we also heard a report from the Chief Compliance Officer. And Pam gave us basically a statistical summary of what her office had done during the past year. Uh, again, as you might expect, uh, the number of reports are down, number of actions are, are down because of the delayed return and because of the COVID situation in general. With that, there's yes, the report. Thank you, Judge Poston. Any questions? All right, excellent. Uh, that. Uh, oh, Committee on Financial Affairs. Uh, Mr. Begg, are you filling in for that? Yeah, yes, I am. Okay. Um, th thank you, Mr. Director. I'd like to call uh, Amy Sebring to sort of guide us through the presentation. Good morning. Um, I would just note that the committee did not meet, um, so I wanted to provide a quick up financial update for the full board this morning, and I will walk through this quickly. Um, as you know, I mean, we've been doing this, I think, on a pretty regular basis in terms of providing you with an update of our anticipated shortfall for this fiscal year. Um, since we met in August, uh, we continue to hover in the low $30 million range in terms of shortfall. And as you can see, it's a combination of um, both reductions in revenue, um, the, the biggest area of which is housing, um, not surprisingly, with 27%, I think, is the latest number I heard, Madam Provost. 27% of our undergraduates studying fully remotely. Uh, we've seen that reflected in terms of housing contracts this year. And what I would say in looking at the overall financial picture actually is that uh, the impacts we're feeling are very consistent um, with the principles that the President referenced this morning in terms of how we've been navigating through the pandemic. Um, we, we intentionally have set forth a course that allows for flexibility. And so, you know, we knew going in that that might have some ramifications in terms of revenue for our students if they chose not to be back with us on campus this fall, but felt that was an important principle uh, for the community. Similarly, on the expense side, as you can see there, um, on the expense side, I mean, a, a significant uh, piece of our increased expenses are directly related to the public health precautions that we've put in place. Um, the work we're doing around testing, contact tracing, uh, the contracts that we have there. Technology has actually permeated throughout um, and was, was driven by COVID, but I think as you heard from Ms. Roday, will likely uh, impact us in, in far more meaningful ways going forward. And then I uh, wanted to touch a little bit in terms of uh, the realignment work that we've done. And so I know for academic affairs, you all heard yesterday um, some highlights in terms of the activities uh, and the transformations that have occurred both here on campus and also remotely uh, to provide the academic experience and the level of excellence that our students anticipate. I will keep at every opportunity uh, providing a shout out to the studio for teaching and learning innovation um, and the work that they've done, but really importantly, it's the work that the faculty have done um, to, to train up, if you will, and to be able to provide uh, learning opportunities for students in, in new ways. We haven't spent as much time, um, at least uh, as a group, talking about the work that's been happening through the Reeves Center and the focus on international study. Uh, they recognized early on that we would have international students that wouldn't be able to join us um, in, in the ways that we are used to this year. And so you can see there some of the, the work that they've done both to provide opportunities for students who remain abroad, uh, but then also um, a lot of work around process improvements in terms of the advising that they're doing, making credit transfer uh, you know, easier, and really creating some automation on the, in the back office work, if you will, in the Reeves Center. Research, likewise, I don't think we've spent as much time there, uh, but, but Virginia, um, and when we look at our, our peers across Virginia, we actually were out early in trying to make sure that our students could continue to have meaningful research experiences, particularly over the summer. Uh, we actually were able to keep students engaged at a higher level than many of our colleagues across the state, and so um, that's been an important adaptation as well. 
And then I've added in, I think uh, Ms. Roday referenced a few of these in terms of the work that we've been doing with tutors, uh, remote, both for students here and remotely, and then a lot of work in, this, in the Cohen Career Center to ensure, as the president referenced, that particularly for our students who um, are about to emerge as graduates, continue to provide opportunities for them um, in, in new and different ways. Um, the, the reason that this is part of the finance uh, presentation today, and, and I was going to walk through uh, many of the student experience items, but Ms. Roday, you did an exceptional job in going through those and were way more eloquent than I could be. Um, what this means for us from a resource standpoint is that we've really had to reallocate resources and think differently this year about um, you know, dollars that we would have spent in other ways in prior years we're putting into these programs this year. And it's both dollars um, and it's staffing time and talent. So you've heard in previous reports from the president that you know, um, we, we have been moving people across the organization and, and asking people to pitch in in new ways to help support these new programs. With all of that, I still would say, um, although I am uh, pleased with where we are, uh, given all of the uncertainty that we were approaching coming into this fiscal year, um, there's still plenty of uncertainty. And so uh, the General Assembly, as you know, is in special session uh, currently reviewing the budget. Um, actually, the House dropped the budget this morning. So I haven't um, had a chance to look at that in detail, but I think um, indications are that the state recognizes how critical um, this period of time is for higher education, and I'm not expecting significant um, negative actions. We may actually see some positive actions coming out of the special session. Um, as you know, uh, we have a pending bond sale that we are, are moving towards, but until that's done, it's not done. So um, still looking at mid-October, and I'll talk through that a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Um, the impact for this fall, um, you heard from Mr. Broadus yesterday um, about what, what spring enrollments look like. Um, but it continues to be important for our students that they are having positive experiences this fall, recognizing um, that we want them to return in the spring and feel confident um, that, that they can do so. The 2021 General Assembly session, um, I, do, I do have concerns about what FY22 will look like for us. Um, the state actually right now is in a pretty good cash position, and so Secretary Lane has, has said repeatedly um, that, that in the immediate period of time, uh, we're in better shape than I think uh, they originally anticipated. But from a base budget, the FY22 budget becomes the base for the next biennium. And so they've signaled pretty heavily that, that we may expect um, some reductions in FY22. And then, of course, obviously, the, the health conditions will continue to evolve, and um, that will remain uncertain until uh, this is all behind us. Um, and, and positively, I think we're looking to summer 2021 as um, you know, an area that may also help us navigate financially. So there's a lot of plus minus on this list, but just wanted to underscore that uncertainty does remain. Um, I think you know, we're in, in a reasonably solid position for now, but a $30 million shortfall is a significant shortfall. Um, so I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, um, sugarcoat that in any way. I mean, you all know, for those of you that have been on the board for some time, um, you know, we, we worked a number of years to find $5 million in savings through business innovation. So $30 million for this in institution is still a significant sum, and we continue to navigate through. The last piece that I will mention, because this was part of one of the tools in the toolkit that we've talked about over the last several months, um, is just a quick update on, on where we are with the bond package. Um, as you'll recall, in August, you authorized the president and I to pursue up to $200 million uh, in debt authorization. Um, the, the three components of that, uh, we had $70 million in general purpose new debt that uh, was part of that package, $20 million in new dorm renovations, and then uh, $54 million is where um, we are landing in terms of the portion of debt refunding that we believe will issue under uh, the university's own uh, credit rating. Um, you may have heard, I think Tuesday of this, this week, the governor announced that the state um, is pursuing a refunding of bonds. Um, it, as part of that release, uh, the, the governor's office indicated that the potential savings for William & Mary was $33.7 million. Um, the, we are working through with our financial advisor and think actually the best path forward for William & Mary will be to do a combination of uh, 
our own refunding in some instances and the state uh, using the state in other instances. And the short version of that is there are really three criteria that we're looking at there. No question the state can get better interest rates than we can. Uh, they're a triple A bond rating. And so we know if we were only looking at interest rates that the state would be the, the best financial vehicle for us. But we're also looking at the timing in terms of when we would uh, benefit from um, cash flow standpoint on the refundings. Much of what the state is anticipating would actually be um, a sale uh, likely at the end of this fiscal year or maybe even next fiscal year. So being able to go out and do some of our own refunding now is actually more beneficial to us in the, in the current fiscal year. And then um, the state is doing refundings for the entire Commonwealth. And so they're looking to optimize the debt service schedules in the aggregate. Uh, by doing our own refinancing or refunding, um, we can actually tailor those debt service payments in a way that's most beneficial to the university. So you'll see there uh, where we sit right now is we're looking at um, in the aggregate through a combination of the 54 million refunding on our own and then the additional refunding that we may pursue with the state at a future date, that would put us at a, an overall savings, uh, well, cash flow of 37.8 million. Um, key dates are outlined there just in terms of uh, the major um, milestones that we have in the next few weeks. The Treasury Board did approve on whatever day the 23rd was uh, this week. They did approve um, us uh, being able to do our own refunding on 9C debt. We did, have, we did require their authority. Um, skipping down, you'll see on October 1st, Virginia College Building Authority actually is holding a special meeting at our request. Uh, with a similar resolution on the 9D refunding so that we can move forward there. On Monday, uh, I will be meeting with my team um, with S&P uh, to do the initial interview for the bond rating. We expect that rating will come by uh, no later than uh, October 9th, and then we'll pursue the sale immediately thereafter. So that we are completely on track. That's consistent with, I think, the update that I gave you in August and uh, feeling really good about where we are. Questions? Um, a, a couple, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Kerr for a question on the phone. Um, on this slide, um, I just want to be clear. When we say new dorm renovations, we mean new renovations on existing dorms. Correct. Okay. Yes, so sir. Don't want anybody to think we're going out and starting a bunch of new dorms. Correct. Um, and then when we talk about the, the previous slide, when we talk about the $30 million shortfall, I mean, you know, again, it's a little... Uh, generic, but we, you know, we've been talking about a range of 30 to 150 million <clears throat> this year. I know a lot of that is looking for what happens in the spring semester, but between the 30 million, which you give it, you're giving really good detail and seems pretty, you know, um, tested there. Um, is there, are there any um, steps along the way between now and the spring semester that could cause a significant, a significant increase? Meaning, we're at 30 million now. Are we sort of going to be at 30 million until we get to December, January, or are there some things between now and December that could increase that that current deficit? Between now and December, um, the the you know, two key variables I think would be if the General Assembly were to take any negative budget action against us in the special session. Again, I don't think that's likely given what we're hearing out of Richmond. Um, the other would be, obviously, if we ended up, um, you know, for whatever reason, if the public health situation forced us to, you know, send everybody home as we did in the spring, I, I don't anticipate that's where we're going to land either, but that obviously would have, have um, significant impact. You know, people keep asking me, what, what's the next date that we'll know? Um, I think, you know, the next major date for us will be early February when we get uh, locked in in terms of enrollments for the spring semester. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Carr? Amy covered it. I was looking for the estimated number of the savings from the refinance and state bonds. So thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Hey, Amy, can I ask a question also? Tom Watkins Chair. Of course. Uh, two questions. First of all, on the um, S&P um, rating, do you expect any surprises or do you expect a reaffirmation of our current bond rating, credit rating? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, 
you know, it, it's a tough time to be in higher ed, and so uh, the markets are a little nervous, uh, the, or the bond rating agencies are a little nervous. Um, if we didn't have COVID, I would uh, say I was uh, firmly confident. Uh, but I, th I think we're, we will be in good shape. Um, we've been, you know, working um, hard with our financial advisor and, and the entire finance team. Um, and, I, you know, as I said, I think we're in, in relatively good position, even with COVID amongst us. So uh, I, think, I think we will, they will reaffirm. Long answer. Sorry. That's fine. And second question, um, relative to your comments about state financing uh, versus William Mary own financing on the bonds, how would you handicap the likelihood now that we'd go William Mary alone, which I think was your original expectation uh, a month ago? Do you think that's the more likely scenario or do you think it's 50-50 uh, that we might do something with the state? What's, what's your read yeah. on so, that? So actually, um, the scenario back in, in August still included a little piece of um, state uh, refunding as well. Um, the yeah. interesting, the, the the developments we've we've spent a lot of time with Treasury Board uh, and the Treasury Department staff over the last month. Um, actually, part of the governor's package. Um, I'll try to fast forward to that slide. Part of the governor's 33.7 million. Um, the the there's actually a code provision um, that prohibits them from refunding 9C debt. Uh, it was a co-provision put in place in 1992. We initially thought that they would go out with that this fall. And so in, in our initial modeling, we were expecting that we would go with the state on the 9C debt and uh, potentially refund our, uh, on our own on the 9, on 9D. Um, but they actually will require General Assembly action in 2021 in order to be able to do that refunding. So we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, uh, what does is, what is their 9D refunding look like relative to ours, which is, you know, where we ended up at the mix that we're at now. You're in sync with your uh, Raymond James advisor on, on this path forward, I'm presuming. Yes, we've probably done another 20 scenarios since uh, we last met, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this is, this is sound. Uh, we all, we approved it last month, but I commend you and your team for the work that's been done here on the debt. It's very important to William Mary and, Sounds to me like you're totally ready to go. It's not over till it's over, but we're in a good position, sir. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right. Um, okay, just. I just want to say thank you to your whole team, Amy. Um, you guys have been pulling a lot of all-nighters. Um, just about every division, and they've been working together in a wonderful way to be able to mount this kind of response. And to hear what the students said to Ms. Rode is something they should feel really proud of. Thank you. Great. Um, the Subcommittee on Investments did not meet, Mr. Rector. Um, I do want to note that we will be meeting with uh, members of the student body to understand their concerns around fossil fuel and uh, increasing investments in minority businesses, uh, hopefully before the next board meeting. Excellent. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Bay? All right. Um, that completes our um, standing committee reports. Um, we'll go into reports from our um, representatives, and we will start with uh, the Student Assembly President, uh, Anthony Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Rector. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am so glad to see you all here today. As I mentioned last month, our ability to meet in person speaks to our success. This certainly has been a rocky ride, um, but the good stewardship of students, faculty, and staff towards our commitment has kept us here. Students, you are integral to, the, to our success. Thank you for continuing to act safe, safely. Thank you for wearing your masks and wearing them properly above your nose. So if you see somebody, please tell them to put it above their nose. Um, thank you for holding others accountable. Our community, all of us have successfully adhered to the Healthy Together commitment and have spread that commitment beyond our campus walls. Williamsburg, when I was here in August, is unrecognizable to Williamsburg now. Um, we need to keep this energy through November, though. We cannot let up now. The Student Assembly, through its Six Feet of Fun newsletter, working with other student organizations and the administration, 
will continue to devise and promote ways for us to continue to safely engage with one another in person. And I think especially as we move into the colder season, we need to critically think about those things. The Student Assembly is continuing to work with the administration to respond to our issues with diversity and inclusion. Our plan to tackle systemic racial injustice will close this Sunday. Um, the applications, of course, and we are excited to invite students beyond SA into this mission. Specifically, we look forward to creating a student advisory group with Chief Cheesebro, using reports from cities across the country based on goals presented in former President Obama's 21st Century Task in Task Force on Policing. We will give a status report on our various plan projects and initiatives by the end of October to students in the William Mary community and present them to the board at our next meeting in November. Um, furthermore, Dr. Rowe, thank you for your transparency and process, particularly on President Ewell. Um, and I do encourage the DRB to review and to release that data so that students can also understand and have their own insights on this process. Um, that was very much the talk of the summer. And there was a lot of opinions, negative opinions about Yule, and I think it's important for us to, grapply, to, to openly grapple with that history, as it is very complex, as you had mentioned. Furthermore, administration, thank you for your acts of smart leadership. We successfully completed a second round of testing, as Dr. Rowe had already mentioned, for all students on campus, and our numbers are surprisingly reassuring. Students are very appreciative of this, and the prevalence, to, and the prevalence testing, and even encourage another round of full testing in October if that's possible. It is no secret that it is not the job of a university to have such a robust testing service, and we appreciate the countless hours you have all spent to make William & Mary and the greater Williamsburg area as safe as possible. However, as much as, as I would like to take more of a moment to relish in our fortune, there are recent events that undermine our success and even make it negligible. What threatens our fragile stability that we have created really falls into three domains, transparency, communication, and accountability. From the onset of the renewed racial reckoning in this country to the various COVID-19 decisions, we have elevated student requests to improve in these areas time and time again, but to no avail. The current tragic predicament of the 118 student athletes whose teams were cut is another horrid instance of our failures in these domains. I hope all of you had time to listen to the listening session on Wednesday and the passionate remarks made by my fellow students, faculty, alumni, and friends. I will do my best not to repeat what they eloquently said, but will pull some language from a resolution from the Student Assembly that was passed Tuesday titled, For the Bold. This was a product of many weeks of talking with student athletes and deliberating on language. I recognize that some of the language within the resolution may, not, may seem without context to you, but it does reflect the lack of clarity students currently have, which does ultimately fall upon us. Simply put, students do not know what the truth is. Essentially, the resolution asks for the administration to urgently improve its communications to the student body. It explains how student athletes receive different information regarding their sports and how they feel lied to. It critiques the way they were given the news and how so much time has passed without concrete answers. It also critiques the open letter that was sent out and how it undermines our honor code and our social fabric. There is a lot of misinformation out there and the student assembly feels that up till now, there has not been enough effort to explain clearly, to apologize for the frustrating confusion and work with student athletes to design a new way forward. Student athletes are now another group that feels alienated by the university of love and we as their chief advocates vehemently opposed how this was handled. Nonetheless, above all, despite the criticism, the resolution reaffirms your statement, Madam President, that we need to urgently rebuild trust, improve communication, clear communication, own our past failures, and chart a new path forward that involves everyone proactively, not retroactively. This is what accountability looks like, not just an apology, but apologetic action. In these challenging times, we also need to lead with our values, particularly belonging, respect, and integrity. And board, preserving and improving our values starts with us. For instance, 
when we announce that we will have a listening session, primarily for students, we should first release that information to students. We do not actively read the Daily Press or the Gazette. We should first ask what modes of communication will reach students successfully, and then alert them as, with as much as advance notice as possible. We have really busy schedules, especially with Zoom classes. It's hard for us to get out of the virtual classroom to be here in person. We need to discuss with our William & Mary community what we think transparency means, our definition, what they think transparency means, their definition, and how we can reconcile those differences and how to act on a new definition. I think that's particularly important because I think there's a lot of different opinions on what that word actually means. I know and want to believe that you are all good intentioned. I have worked with most of you in this room and know you always put William Mary first, that you put students first, but those good intentions need to last beyond this hall, beyond our conversations, beyond the words we put in announcements and emails. It needs to be followed through by action, and in this instance, urgent action. The integrity of our university is being questioned. It seems as if my reports to you become increasingly difficult to deliver. I feel the same way, but part of my responsibility is to share what is on the minds of students, and they feel that their concerns are not being adequately addressed. But it's in that spirit that I compassionately criticize and further request you all to reaffirm our partnership between the administration and the student assembly. We can provide context, much needed context to decisions that are being made and how to successfully communicate them to the student body. As the closest people to the ground, we can provide you with a sense of what the campus is feeling and candid feedback. We ask you and we urge you to use us now after all, we all desire the same thing, for William and Mary to be successful in one of the most challenging moments in her history. Please call on us and we will rise to the occasion. Thank you, that is my report. Thank you very much, any questions? Good, um, President Newby. Good morning. Thank you, um, Mr. Rector. I'm just so glad to be here today and, and it's good to be with you all in person. The staff, and, the staff assembly and PPA express tremendous gratitude to the board for the resolution that allowed the staff, especially our hourly employees, to be off the Monday after Thanksgiving. We could not thank you enough. Just to report back, the virtual water coolers have continued to be successful, which is the engagement um, the staff assembly has put on to find out what is going on within the staff. How can we communicate? What communication gaps are existing that keeps us from um, understanding what's going on with the university? Um, to follow up with that, PPFA has created a um, break room which will emulate that same conversation with its constituents. We recognize with the water coolers that we are not seeing all staff, but this allows us to continue to close those loops. And we are working together to um, make sure that we have all staff voices at the table. Um, both forums do talk about concerns regarding equity, diversity, and inclusion, our biopic populations on campus, um, institutional in issues surrounding salary, potential instability of jobs, continue issues of supervisor-staff relationships that remain prevalent among staff even under pandemic. Recent decisions regarding the athletics department and the impact of the seven student teams, continued health and safety concerns among, especially among our vulnerable populations are raised um, consistently within these conversations. And also, we would also like to say that we request there be a pulse check for employees prior to the start of spring um, to recognize the wins and improvements that will be needed to move forward, <clears throat> not only in COVID, but also in the issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion. We are glad to hear in President Rowe's statement this, that <clears throat> there is an, sorry, that there is an, 
after action review plan to be undertaken this winter before the spring semester begins for non-academic departments where our constituencies are most found. We recognize there is so much uncertainty to spring um, and we continue to hold our breath through this process. And we are hoping that that additional day after Thanksgiving will allow us to re-energize and think critically about how the university moves forward. And we implore everyone on campus to work with your departments, work with your staff to make the best plan possible. The staff assembly has seen significant retention during my last term and current term as president. I am happy to report that probably for the first time in a while, we do not need a midterm election. That is significant. That means we are retaining our current members and that the pandemic has not stopped the work that we are doing to the point that staff members have to give up their service because we have seen that year over year over year. Overall, our meeting engagement has increased and we are seeing consistently between the water coolers and our meetings, 60 to 70 staff members per session, which is huge. <laughs> Um, the biggest concern among all constituencies is around the budget and continued transparency of the issues at hand. As we know, we continue to wait for the final financial numbers to be determined for this year and the potential implication those determinations may have on personnel, i.e. furloughs, layoffs, salary cuts, and thereof. It is appreciated that the university has begun moving staff and PPS in vulnerable areas, areas to Assist those of the, to assist those areas in the universities that have the greatest need. And I will say staff have really risen to that challenge. And they have done it with just tremendous effort, excitement, and just making sure that we continue to be the community that we say we are. Our assemblies support these decisions in that they are intended to assist the greater university community and also those employees that are directly involved or impacted. Members of the staff assembly and PPA continue to be impressed with the university's testing efforts. We do commend this administration, all those involved to making it possible. I'm gonna skip down just a little bit. Um, one area that I would like to bring in is yesterday, um, Sean, had ex Sean Glover had expressed how the pandemic has exposed inequities in communications. Inequities span far and deep regarding the lack of sense of belonging among staff. We must be honest and recognize the classification system work to our detriment and not to our benefit in ensuring campus-wide communications. We also need to recognize that increasing diversity within the faculty as a priority does not solve the entire situation of inclusion and equity issues on this campus. This effort needs to be rounded out by providing empowerment and, and recognizing that representation of staff of color matters. Students of color flourish when all communities of color on campus flourish. I challenge those, this board, the administration, departmental leadership to use this pandemic in place of change to engage staff about their perspectives regarding office development, personal and professional development, and shared expectations to build the trust necessary to break barriers and increase, increase flourishing on campus. Keep that strategic and thoughtful energy you put into students and faculty into staff. Students, especially of color, need to see staff flourishing and empowered. In addition, we need to remember and promote that we are a major employer in Williamsburg and in the 757. We must not forget and use this to our advantage to sustain the future of our institution. With that, I would like to say thank you to the president, provost, COO, and various administration who have been so supportive during this time, especially for me and the staff. I would like to also thank the PPFA president and vice president for our powerful and meaningful partnership that has been significant as we work through these challenges under pandemic. I would also like to thank the presidents of the faculty assembly and student assembly for our powerful relationship as well. And most of all, I would definitely like to say thank you to all the staff who are working on campus, doing the day to day, being those boots on the ground and keeping William and Mary standing tall. And I would also like to say thank you for trusting me to be your voice and your advocate. 
I remain honored and humbled. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to just uh, uh, make sure it was clear in my comments in the beginning, expressing our admiration and appreciation. I, I did include the staff, and I what the point that you made I think is really uh, critical. Um, there's probably no uh, group of people on campus that have had their jobs more altered by this. You know, the faculties are changing the way they do their job, but uh, all over campus you see people that you know, now are opening doors, now are doing traffic control, now are delivering food, now are doing whatever. And I think it's really great that everybody stepped up, came up with new ideas, and uh, really are making uh, a lot of this stuff happen that could not have happened. So just want to make sure that uh, our appreciation is, is really clear for that. So thank you. Um, uh, uh, David, Professor David Armstrong, who is the president of Faculty Assembly, uh, is filling in for Professor Tom Ward, uh, who has an excused absence. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mr. Rector. You, you never get away from us, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I won't be able to be as eloquent or persuasive as either AJ or Ariel, uh, but I will provide a few remarks. First of all, thanking again the administration and the staff for allowing us, to providing the way for us to come back in person and very much to the students. Uh, I don't think any of us really believed that the testing rates would be so positive, that the student response to the pandemic would be so supportive, and uh, that really this is a much healthier and safer environment than many of us feared. Um, the semester is well underway. Some of the students have actually been taking midterms. Um, I gave my own midterm last week. I think things generally are going well. It's a little hard for me to get a good perspective because the informal conversations around the buildings don't happen in the same way they would have. Um, but there was a student survey that uh, asked the question, for those courses that you're now taking remotely, how do they compare to the remote courses that you took in the, uh, well, it gets dark when the faculty member speaks, right? Uh, <laughs> How do they compare to the remote classes you took in the spring? And 65% said that the remote classes are better now. Another 15% said about the same. And only 20% said they were not as good. And in fact, I would positively say, well, maybe the 20% we did so well in the remote classes in the spring that it's maybe only slightly less good. To... Um, but there are challenges working for the first three weeks of the semester for most of us remote, then switching to either some blend of remote and in-person, and in-person is challenging. The technology is always challenging. When I'm now teaching, I have a laptop, an iPad, and the PC, and I am teaching both remotely and in-person simultaneously. So the technology is a challenge. Many of my faculty colleagues, when they originally wanted to teach in-person, and then some students said, well, I have to be remote. Students stuck in China, students who for family or medical reasons couldn't be in person. We opened up extra sections, and so are teaching sometimes two sections of one class, sometimes simultaneously. The compressed schedule, uh, one week shorter schedule, uh, when we planned that, I didn't think this would be a problem. But I'm finding that my faculty colleagues and the students are finding the additional stress of that shortened semester is significant and that the students are reporting that the blended learning and the learning online is taking a heavier workload. Faculty are jealous about reducing the amount of content in their courses but we're reevaluating in some cases the need to do that because of the compressed uh, schedule. Research and scholarship on site I think is, on, is going well but it has been curtailed in many cases for people whose scholarship has been national or international travel has been required. Grad students are reporting that they're doing well in general, but some are, are slowed down. Some undergraduate research is slowed down. Faculty in our research and scholarship, you, in, uncertainty is at the basis of research and scholarship, but uncertainty can be stressful and draining. And we're having uncertainty, of course, because the financial uh, situation with the university. Faculty are concerned about salary actions potentially, about furloughs, and in particular our contingent faculty, the faculty that don't have the protections of tenure, are particularly apprehensive. Add that to the stress of health for themselves, health for their families, for the students and staff, and concerns about the pandemic. 
the stresses of additional technology in many cases. Many of our faculty have children of their own, and of course, if they're in the James City and York County and Williamsburg school systems, those kids are learning from home, so the faculty members are teachers in absentia when they're trying to teach. And of course, the concern of uncertainty about what happens if the pandemic gets worse and we're forced to close. But I think we've been thriving under the, the uncertainty. The stress has been significant. Um, the faculty assembly is working on a number of things in partnership, in many cases, with the provost. Uh, we're revamping or looking again our policy on non-tenure eligible faculty on contingent faculty university-wide. Uh, we've been asked to look at the faculty research leave program and revisit that, especially uh, under financial constraints. Um, we're working with Dr. Glover on the uh, hiring plan, the three-year pilot, and how that will be implemented. We've also been asked to look at Title IX policy revisions that Will William & Mary has done and how that uh, the provisional uh, policies relating, relating to the Title IX changes um, and giving our input on that. And be happy to ask any, answer any questions. Thank you. Um, I, I would just note in response to that that um, while it would be inappropriate for me to make any kind of absolute point about um, certainty in this time of uncertainty um, relative to um, funding programs, anything like that. I, I do think it has been pretty clear that this board um, has worked really hard and a high priority of ours is to ensure that we are not in a place of furloughs or salary cuts other than for the people who are having the salary cuts right now. Sorry. Um, but, uh, and that, you know, that's going to continue to be a, a priority. Every single board member spoke to that uh, during our meetings over the summer and, you know, we know that the president is totally focused on making sure that we uh, have as little impact to people's livelihoods as possible. Thank you for that. And I would add that personally, I've been very impressed with the administration of the board's focus on maintaining employment for our staff and our, our vulnerable staff. And I, I applaud that that has been a high priority. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, in old business, uh, we covered the COVID update, so I don't think there are any, any parts there, um, but probably an update on the memorial to the enslaved. Good afternoon. I am standing between you and lunch, so I will be brief. I just wanted to give you an update on the memorial to the enslaved, uh, the hearth, hearth memorial to the enslaved. In August, we shared with you the preliminary design and the, the renderings. And on yesterday, the DRB approved the design. I'm really happy about that. Thank you so much, Mr. Payne and your committee. Just want to let you know where we are now and what happens next. Uh, basically, this is kind of the downtime that the architects will be working to deliver for the next uh, meeting with the DRB for a building permit. And so you will not hear a lot of what's going on for the next couple of months. You will, however, see the signs that are up around campus, which we're really excited about. And you heard yesterday um, AJ's uh, comments about how the student assembly is taking this on and embracing it during this time. We hope we met our fundraising goal. I want to thank Dr. Lambert and advancement team for pivoting One Tribe One Day because that truly, truly made a big difference in uh, the money that was collected and, and raised for the uh, memorial. So we met our fundraising goal. And the, the next step, the next level for us is waiting for the building permit. The proposed timeline is that we would hopefully have the building permit by early January and that we would begin construction uh, in, in February. And then we would continue all the way through October is when we would hope to actually be able to reveal. And, and open uh, the memorial. We will have a slight pause in June because we are going to um, celebrate our area, our area's first inaugural, well, our inaugural Juneteenth celebration. And so they have agreed to kind of pause because we really want to have the celebration there and the, the meaning that's behind that. So 
it's, it's exciting. I want to thank the president for her commitment to helping us get this move forward. I want to thank the building committee uh, that's been working pretty hard since last July. And uh, we're really excited. The, I think the memorial is going to be a great addition to campus and a wonderful milestone. So that's the update. Thank you. Great. Any questions? Great. So are you going to be the, the construction overseer, keep them on track? Absolutely. Oh, you are? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Amy's meaner than you are, so. That's right. That's right. Amy is right there. All right. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, any other old business? All right. We have um, one uh, new business. Um, we have a resolution honoring Ed Chappelle. Uh, Mr. Payne, are you introducing that? Yes, uh, we have a resolution honoring Ed Chappell, who passed away on July 25th. Uh, Ed was a member of the Design Review, Review Board and left his mark on this campus. And let me just uh, read this, I'll be brief. Uh, Edward A. Chappell, Jr., class of 72, led efforts to uncover and shape the buildings and landscape of William & Mary, Williamsburg, and the Commonwealth. A highly respected architectural historian and preser preservationist, he was a powerful proponent for humane and well-informed design and neighborly debate. Mr. Chappell approached preservation in a forward-looking way with a commitment to uncovering a more complete and complex uh, picture of our history. His critique of design was anchored in his field-based knowledge of early American buildings, his studious attention to the work of the 1920s Rockefeller Restoration, and his deep understanding that good details define the best buildings. During his many years on William Mary's Design Review Board, Mr. Chappell's expertise was unsurpassed. His insight enhanced architectural and landscape projects, transforming each into a better version of itself. Among his most notable contributions to the university, he advised and gave input on the formal investigation and historic structure reports on the Wren Building, the Bradford and the President's House, and the Dudley Diggs House, now the Bray School. A vocal champion for historic preservation in Williamsburg, Mr. Chappell was a steadfast leader, an active citizen. He advocated successfully for Pollard Park and Chandler Court to be added to the National Register of Historic Places. Mr. Chappell studied, Mr. Chappell's studied and thoughtful contributions are apparent in each of the projects he touched. These stand as a testament to his enduring legacy throughout the Commonwealth in his long professional career at Colonial Williamsburg and especially his alma mater. Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Visitors recognizes the extraordinary service and accomplishments of Edward A. Chappell, Jr., and expresses its appreciation for his efforts that have enriched the landscape of William & Mary, this town, and our state. And be it further resolved that this resolution be included in the minutes of the Board, and a copy of the same be delivered to his wife, Susan Buck, with profound gratitude for Mr. Chappell's remarkable life and scholarship. Uh, thank you, Mr. Payne. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Any, any discussion? Mr. Fox? Mr. Rector. Aye. Mr. Payne? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ambassador Aponte? Aye. Mr. Baig? Aye. Mr. Branch? Aye. Mr. Bunch? Aye. Ms. Gertelman? Aye. Ms. Hudson? Aye. Ms. Kerr? Aye. Judge Poston? Aye. Ms. Rode? Aye. Ms. Schultz? Aye. And Mr. Watkins? Aye. All right, the motion carries. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, um, that concludes our um, uh, open session um, items. We are about to go into closed session, and for those of you who are in the room or listening in, um, we will come out of closed session. The only action that we will take when we come out of closed session is to pass a resolution coming out of closed session. There are no resolutions that will be that will be passed or considered after we come out of that. Um, and there'll only be very brief uh, closing comments because usually by then it's just us in the room. Um, so uh, it is your, uh, up to you if you wanna listen in or wait uh, to listen in, but there will be no uh, business that comes out of that. Um, before we go into closed session, I do want to thank the staff that made this meeting possible. Um, there were a lot of additional things that needed to be done and a lot of new people. Um, obviously, the Secretary of the Board, Michael Fox, and the Deputy Secretary, Jessica Walton, have done an awesome job 
um, coordinating all that and uh, providing the materials to us and making sure that uh, our proceedings are available to people who are there. Um, Steve Tewksbury, of course, manages everything from what we eat to how we get into the building, so thank you very much for that. Uh, and his team, Andrea Harris, Jennifer Fox, uh, Anna Rock, and um, we are joined by Nancy. Is she here? Nancy has to go back. Okay. Uh, what is Nancy's last name? Pal. Nancy Powell from the, uh, the Health Center, uh, Chief Cheeseborough, uh, Officer Chris Crockett, and uh, anyone else? And of course, uh, uh, the President's team and, and the deans, thank you very much for all the work that you do, especially for the work that goes on in the uh, uh, preparing for the committees and the committee work, so thank you. All right, uh, if there's no other uh, public business, um, I'd like to ask the secretary to uh, read the resolution taking us into closed um, session. And at that time, I believe we only need the president and the general counsel. I move the board go into closed session for the following reasons. Pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711.8.1 for discussion of the assignment and performance of specific officers or employees, including the presidents of William and Mary and RBC and members of the departments of athletics and code review, and pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711.8.7 and 8.8 .8 for consultation with legal counsel and others regarding actual or probable litigation and specific personnel and compliance matters requiring legal advice. Pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711.8.11 for discussion of honorary degrees. Pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711.8.19 for discussion of specific cybersecurity threats or vulnerabilities identified through penetration testing and vendor notifications and the actions taken to respond to such matters. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Rector. Aye. Mr. Payne. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ambassador Ponte. Aye. Mr. Baig. Aye. Mr. Branch. Aye. Mr. Bunch. Aye. Ms. Girdleman. Aye. Ms. Hudson. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Rodet. Aye. Ms. Schultz. Aye. And Mr. Watkins. Aye. Okay. Um, if the observers would leave the room. Good. All right. Ms. Johnson. I move that we certify by roll call vote that to the best of each member's knowledge, only matters lawfully exempted from the open meetings requirement under the Freedom of Information Act were discussed, and only matters identified in the motion to have the closed session were discussed. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Rector. Aye. Mr. Payne. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ambassador Ponte. Aye. Mr. Page. Aye. Mr. Branch. Aye. Mr. Bunch. Aye. Ms. Girdleman. Aye. Did Mr. Hickson ever join? Ms. Hudson. Aye. Ms. Kerr. Aye. Judge Poston. Aye. Ms. Rode. Aye. Ms. Schultz. Aye. Mr. Watkins. Aye. And did Mr. Woolfolk ever join? Nope. Mr. Rector. All right, I want to thank everyone, uh, all my colleagues on the board for, for participating in this and uh, uh, being present for a few days on campus. I want to uh, uh, thank all the people who have participated uh, either on uh, the internet or present in the room um, and uh, really do appreciate uh, the work that's going on here. We have a lot of work going forward and uh, we look forward to be in conversation about that. So with that, I will uh, adjourn the meeting and uh, thank you very much.